Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Questions. Question number one, John Finney. Thank you. You ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what proportion of the Scottish Par Parliamentary Pension Scheme is invested in the fossil fuel, defence and tobacco industries? David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I share the Member's interest in this matter, having been a trustee of the Scottish Parliamentary Pension Scheme for over three years. The Scottish Parliamentary Pension Scheme currently invests in the Bailey Gifford Management Pension Fund and from May 2012 also the Bailey Gifford Diversified Growth Fund. In total, these funds currently hold approximately 4% of assets in oil and gas producers, 1% in oil equipment services and distribution, 2% in tobacco and 4% in defence. Thank you. John Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. I, I thank my colleague uh, David Stewart for that comprehensive reply. Um, uh, you, you'll be aware that th there's been very fine words about peace emanated from here, yet we find we're investing in the arms industry. There's health challenges our nation faces, yet we're investing in BA, um, British American Tobacco. Climate challenge is a major issue, yet we're in investing in BT, Total and Shell. These are public monies that are going to corporations at the expense of citizens uh, and will have an implication for Scotland and beyond. And I think Scotland wants to be good uh, global citizens. I, I wonder would the member agree to prepare an early report for members' consideration laying out how divestment in those unethical areas could be undertaken, please? Thank you. David Stewart. Uh, could I thank the uh, member for his question? Perhaps I can give a bit more background about the scheme to try and help and answer the member's point. Um, the trustees of the Scottish Parliamentary Pension Scheme appointed Bailey Gifford as fund managers for the scheme and have delegated the responsibility for day-to-day -day investment management to them. The pension contributions are invested in a pooled funds. That means that the, the Scottish Parliament Pension Scheme is one of a number of investors in the funds. Therefore, under these arrangements, the Scottish Parliamentary Pension Scheme does not directly own any stocks and therefore cannot direct investments. In order to do so, they would need to change to a segregated portfolio arrangement, but moving to a segregated arrangement would be a decision for the fund trustees and would depend on a number of factors, such as the practicalities of such a change, any cost implications, and whether the value of the funds was sufficient to support a segregated arrangement. However, I will take this opportunity to write to the trustees of the Scottish Parliament Pension Scheme to ask them to consider this matter in much more detail. Many thanks. Question number two, Cara Hilton. Um, to ask the Scottish Parliament Parliamentary Corporate Body what resources it provides to allow members to scrutinise the Scottish Government's budget. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In 2009, the Financial Scrutiny Unit was set up by, the, uh, by SPICE to support the committees and individual members to understand and scrutinise the Scottish budget. With pressures on public finances and with the new tax powers on their way to the Parliament, financial scrutiny is an increasingly vital function of the uh, Parliament. And I thank Cara Hilton for a question, not least in allowing me to highlight the recent development of some online interactive tools now available on the Parliament's website, which will assist all members. Uh, one such example uses graphics to allow members to explore the budget at a very detailed level, right down to level four, uh, and see year-to-year -year changes at a glance. Another facility allows members, and indeed members of the public, uh, to vary rates, bans, and some of the underlying assumptions in relation to the new land and buildings transaction tax. Uh, and I think the corporate body would very much welcome feedback from members and indeed the public uh, on how useful they find these innovations. Thank you, Cara Hilton. Thank you for that. Um, in light of the extra powers that will be on the way to Holyrood soon, what additional tools will be available to members to enable them to better scrutinise the government in respect of new powers that might be on the way in respect of tax and welfare? Liam McCarthy. I think it's a, a very valid question, one uh, I think many have been asking. I will, I think, have to wait the outcome of the Smith Commission before uh, we progress uh, any more specific uh, work in terms of uh, the new powers and, and the consequences, implications for the uh, Parliament and its committees. Having said that, uh, SPICE has provided briefing on a number of fiscal uh, welfare issues over the pre-referendum period and has already built up, I think, considerable uh, expertise. SPICE will also, I think, tap into expertise available outside the Parliament, including in our universities and international, uh, internationally. But this is obviously a matter we will keep under constant review over the coming months. Many thanks. Question number three, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether it plans to review the number of passes issued to people who do not work in the parliamentary complex. David Stewart. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Security Office, on behalf of the corporate body, continuously reviews the issuing of passes on an ongoing basis. Uh, this process forms a critical part of the overall security measures and is based on the advice received from the security services. As requested by the corporate body, the Security Office is currently reviewing the policies around the issuing of passes, including those who do not work in the parliamentary complex. Thank you. John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the member for that response. Could the member give any indication of how many passes have been issued to non-members of this parliament or this complex, or non-employed members of this complex? And could you also give me some assurances that the issuing of sponsored passes will be reviewed more regularly and that we do not fall into the accusation that may be made by some that sponsored passes are another form of lobbying which is taking place in this parliament? David Stewart. Thank uh, the member for his uh, question. I will write to the member with uh, the specific points that he wishes uh, to take into account. But perhaps it would be useful to give a wider picture in this issue. Uh, this year, the corporate body introduced changes to the criteria attached to the regular visitor pass category, uh, known as the Parliamentary Support Pass for MSP-sponsored applications. The primary change being that to qualify for a pass, the sponsor is required to confirm the parliamentary purpose for which the pass will be used and that the visitor will attend at Parliament at least weekly, and a condition that the parliamentary support pass holders do not use their access to Parliament to act as lobbyists, paid or unpaid, for any individual or organisation that might seek to influence the political process. The pass is issued an initial three-month period instead of 12 months, as it was under, as it was under the original arrangements. Similarly, for other non-parliamentary building users, the requirement for a contingency of a pass will be challenged at the point of receipt of an application for renewal. Thank you. Question number four, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the corporate body what its position is on offering a small discount or other incentives to encourage the use of cashless payments in the garden level restaurant. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. There are no plans uh, to offer a discount for using the cashless system. However, we would encourage everyone who uses the restaurant to use their card as it is around five times uh, quicker than paying by cash. And obviously, the more the card is used, the better it will be for everybody, particularly when that restaurant is very busy. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, I do very much agree with uh, her enthusiasm for using the cashless system. Uh, I noticed today there were considerable queues, and there have been polite notices there for quite a long time, which people are ignoring. Uh, I do wonder, maybe a penalty then on people who insist on paying by cash? Liz Smith. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the member makes an interesting point. I, I, <laughs> I have to say that that is not uh, something that the corporate body uh, has considered, but I think uh, the member makes a good point about this issue in general, that there have been uh, concerns in the past that sometimes we've run into difficulties because it has been uh, so busy. So I think the corporate body has undertaken to perhaps look at the tap-and-go wave-and-pay system uh, in the future, and that is something that we will certainly take on board. Many thanks. Mm. Question number five, Chick Brody. Thank you. To ask the corporate body what decision it has made on the employment of family members of MSPs and whether this complies with the requirements of European laws on employment, discrimination and human rights and that the legal requirements of any consequent redundancies will be complied with. Liam McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I can tell Chip Brody the SPCB discussed the expenses scheme's transitional arrangements in respect of members employing close family members at its meeting on the 4th of June uh, this year and agreed to return to the issue later in the year. I can also reassure him that the SPCB will, of course, ensure that any decision it makes complies with the relevant legislation. Chick Brody. Uh, I thank uh, Ms McArthur for that uh, answer. I just wonder if, in the event of job redundancies, what rules will be put in place to in assist MSPs on the basis that they cannot there cannot be a like-for-like -like job replacement under redundancy law. How will the administrative support jobs be different? Liam McCarthy. I can certainly understand the, the, the background to Mr Brodie's question. I think it's probably worth reflecting on the fact that the Macintosh review uh, contained uh, recommendations for a transitional provision uh, which was intended to allow the existing arrangements for any family member of staff employed to continue until three months after the date of these next uh, Scottish Parliament elections. Subsequently, obviously, uh, the date for uh, the next election has been moved by 12 months and the corporate body is actively uh, considering uh, how to uh, give effect to the intention 
uh, of, uh, of the scheme running until three months after the next election. We will return uh, to that, I think, in relation to the support provided uh, for anybody affected by that decision. The corporate body will be uh, cognizant of our uh, responsibilities in that respect and will, uh, and will provide uh, any uh, appropriate support that we can. Uh, but I should uh, underscore uh, the fact that the Macintosh Review's recommendation in this regard uh, were subject to legal advice, legal advice that was uh, made available, and therefore we are, uh, I think, uh, confident uh, that, the, uh, that any recommendation from the corporate body, again, will be consistent with any uh, relevant uh, legal requirements placed upon us. Thank you. Question number six, Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body what consideration it has given to commemorating and celebrating the contribution of Margaret Macdonald to the Parliament. Liz Smith. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think everybody in this Parliament appreciates the very considerable contribution made by Margaret Macdonald to the Parliament, uh, just as we also value the very considerable contributions that were made to our other members who have passed away during this Parliament, Brian Adam, David McCletchie and Helen Eady. The SPCB has no policy of commemorating the lives of members or former members who have died, but it is something upon which we're happy to reflect. Thank you. Christine Graham. Uh, can I thank uh, the member for her response? I, I think there is a, a rationale to say we're invidious to single out one MSP, no matter how individualistic and um, significant her contribution was to Scottish politics at large. But I agree there have been, during the course of my time here, and the 15 years, seven deaths uh, of sitting MSPs in service. And I would suggest uh, that perhaps the corporate body would consider some kind of discreet a plaque or memorial uh, listing the MSPs who died in service across the chamber in all parts because we started with Donald Dewar and of course last of all Margaret MacDonald but there have been others in between and perhaps the corporate body would give some thought to this uh, in their coming meetings. Thank you. Liz Smith. Uh, I'm grateful to the member for what is a very uh, considerate and uh, sensitive uh, supplementary question. I think it is something upon which the SPCB should reflect and we can undertake to do that. Many thanks. Question number seven, Alison Johnston. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body how many journeys between mainland Scotland and London were made by road, rail, coach and air in the last year for which figures are available. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much. I can uh, tell Alison Johnston that in 2013-14 there were 21 return journeys between Scotland and London reimbursed under the Members' Expenses Scheme. Uh, 15 of these were by air and six by rail. Many thanks. Alison Johnston. Um, thank you for those figures. Um, speedy travel to London is, of course, sometimes necessary, but it's vitally important that we as a parliament keep reducing our climate emissions. I wonder if the SPCB have further plans to reduce air miles. Um, for example, in my time on committee, we've had one video conferencing session. Are there any plans to expand video conferencing to increase the facilities available and to promote their use by committees and other organisations. Liam MacArthur. I think Alison Johnson makes a very fair point in terms of our own responsibilities uh, in reducing uh, our, our climate emissions, uh, having passed uh, the legislation uh, in the previous Parliament. This is something the corporate body, uh, I think, takes exceptionally seriously uh, and reports on that regularly. As I understand it, our uh, track record in increasing the amount of video conferencing uh, where appropriate um, has happened, but there's clearly more uh, we can be doing. I think in relation to the specifics uh, of, of this question, the, the choice of appropriate method of transport is uh, ultimately the responsibility of individual members and in making that choice members are required to act in accordance with the principles of the reimbursement of members expenses scheme and should be satisfied that the expenses represent value for money uh, and were incurred having due regard to efficiency and effectiveness but I think um, it will do no harm for us to continually reinforce the message about our own responsibilities in terms of uh, in the environmental challenges we face and as a corporate body we will continue to, to do that. Question number eight, Richard Lyle. Thank you, Mr. President. Also, to ask the uh, Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what action has been taken to clean the wall and hang hanging glass panels which are above you in the chamber. Les Smith. <laughs> <laughs> The, the high-level hanging glass panels and walls in the chamber are cleaned on an annual basis during the February recess. Richard Lyle. Well, I, I, can I thank the member for that, that answer? Actually, that was uh, not my understanding, but I, I'll certainly be checking that. Uh, is this work put out to tender or is it done in-house? Les Smith. 
This is a, an important, uh, important issue, I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure of that. Um, it, it, the, the, one of the reasons why it's cleaned on an annual basis is because it's actually extremely uh, expensive to do, and in times of uh, uh, time, it actually takes five to seven days to, to ensure that it can be done uh, properly. So that's one of the reasons uh, why it is uh, uh, done during the February recess, when there is plenty of time uh, to do that. But in answer to the... Uh, question specifically, it's carried out by the high-level fabric maintenance contractor, TRAC International Limited. Many thanks. That uh, concludes questions to the corporate body. And I'm sorry, that it, I'm sorry to the two members I was unable to call, but we must now move on to the next item of business. I'll give a few seconds for members to change places. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 11507 in the name of Angela Constance on progressive workplace policies to boost productivity, growth and jobs. I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, around 14 minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. When I published the report of the Working Together Review of Progressive Workplace Policies on 13th of August, I welcomed the findings and said the Government would consider its recommendations fully engaging directly with business and trade unions and prepare a formal response. Today provides an opportunity for all parties in this Parliament to contribute to that ongoing process and of course our plans for a Fair Work Convention. When the First Minister announced the establishment of a Fair Work Convention at the STUC's Decent Work, Dignified Lives conference, Graham Smith, the General Secretary, said, the STUC enthusiastically welcomes the First Minister's announcement today, the establishment of a Scottish Fair Work Convention, a key recommendation of the Working Together Review, signals a new approach to fair pay and industrial relations in Scotland. The approach stands in stark contrast to the policies of the UK Government. Signing officer, I welcome that recognition that we are focused on what is best for Scotland. I have repeatedly stressed that this Government will work tirelessly to build a labour market and economy that is resilient, adaptable and responsive to change, because that is key to ensuring that Scotland's businesses compete internationally, delivering long-term prosperity and high-quality jobs. We need to support growth that reduces inequalities and helps everyone to realise their potential, particularly women and young people. We need growth that reduces disparities between different parts of Scotland and we need growth that is sustainable and resilient. The labour market statistics published yesterday demonstrate the impact of Scotland's distinctive policy approach. Our economy continues to grow stronger. We are outperforming the UK on employment, unemployment and inactivity rates and the gap between male and female employment has fallen to 5.4%. And I am pleased that we are also seeing progress in youth employment, but of course there is far, far more that needs to be done. Besides, officer, this government is always focused on securing the best outcomes for Scotland. And we believe, and the Working Together Review confirms, that progressive workplace policies can help improve a firm's productivity and innovation and aid sustainable growth, and well-rewarded and sustained employment is indeed the best route out of poverty and the best way to tackle inequality. That is the context for today, and indeed was the context last week when Working Together was discussed at the Business and Parliament Conference. It was Living Wage Week, of course, and many of the businesses present were keen to learn more about living wage accreditation. There was also a strong interest in fair work and progressive policies which boost productivity and an appetite to learn more about the specifics of what has worked in other businesses. The focus on the living wage as one very significant example of progressive workplace policies 
understandably emerged because Rachel McEwen of Scottish and Southern Energy talked of their experiences and what it had delivered for their business. It was very heartening to hear Rachel talk of the positive feedback from the many SSE employees, not just from those who had seen a rise in their income. And that's consistent with the view of KPMG's UK Head of Facilities, uh, Guy Stollard, who is on record as saying uh, offering a living wage uh, is a good uh, business sense. Jenny Mara. Cabinet Secretary for giving way and um, I think SSE's story about the living wage is one that's quite compelling but Scottish and Southern Energy have um, have given the living wage to their contractors as well and they're at pains to point out that actually uh, the EU procurement law is very similar for public bodies as it is for the energy companies. So would the Cabinet Secretary undertake to, to look again in, in the light of SSE's progress about how she can offer the living wage to government contractors too? Cabinet Secretary. I mean, Ms Mara makes an interesting point because we did indeed touch on procurement um, and last week's uh, parliamentary debate on the living wage and also at the business um, parliament conference and I certainly heard SSE you know reflect um, on their experiences and the position of this government uh, as you know clearly articulated by the deputy first minister uh, over many many months uh, is that we have to operate within the context of EU law and of course the stumbling block is that our national minimum wage which is set in statute is a different late different rate uh, from that of the living wage. I know we've had many debates um, about uh, the, the limits of EU law uh, and of course as a government we will always listen and look uh, to learn from the experience uh, of others. Um, but I hope Ms Mara is reassured that it was this government that was the first and indeed the only government to introduce uh, the living wage to all of its staff. Uh, we have currently taken uh, a good step forward uh, with the Procurement Reform Bill, um, having uh, been in the process of introducing statutory guidance. Um, and there are other uh, schemes such as uh, procurement pilot and projects and the living wage accreditation scheme. So we're not resting on our laurels. Uh, we are always looking for ways uh, to ensure uh, that Scotland does indeed uh, become a, a living wage uh, country. Um, President officer, uh, Rachel McEwen also uh, captured the mood of the room when she recognised that different approaches will work for different businesses and that individual organisations are best placed to make their own choices, uh, working with their employees and trade unions. That said, those choices are likely to deliver better outcomes for all if underpinned by a commitment uh, to fair work and access to information about what has worked elsewhere. And that resonates with the case studies which feature uh, in the Working Together review and indeed other examples. And I recently met with the owner of uh, Get It Done Cleaning, uh, the first cleaning company in Scotland to be accredited by the Living Wage Foundation. And the owner of that company spoke very eloquently and made a very compelling case of the benefits that paying the living wage had on his business and how it led to more motivated employees, which in turn resulted in an improvement in staff retention levels. And he also spoke further of how paying the living wage and the accreditation had become a unique selling point uh, to his customers and that actually helped to set his business apart uh, from that of his competitors. And when I visited Inspire in Scotland this summer, uh, I heard firsthand from some of their workers uh, about the vital role flexible and family-friendly working arrangements play uh, in helping people there manage the, the twin responsibilities of work and caring. And that was matched by the Chief Executive's own account of how much of those employees contributed to the organisation and how everybody would lose out if they were not able to offer uh, that balance between work and family commitments. So fair work is an important issue, presiding officer. It impacts directly on business competitiveness and on the lives of individual workers across Scotland. There will be a fair work convention involving trade unions and employer representatives. And my discussions with the STUC yesterday and in the coming weeks with Scottish Chamber of Commerce, SCDI and CBI are about what it will do and how it will deliver. 
The Working Together Review Group recommended that a fair employment framework should be developed through a new stakeholder body with representation from trade unions and employers and that the framework should be based on the what works principles and clear responsibilities for unions, employers, employees and workers. And it should seek to provide support for diversity in the workplace with particular regard uh, to women and young people. Uh, but of course, we also have to think about removing barriers uh, to getting into work and progress in work uh, to other members of the community, whether it's members of the BME community or workers with a, a disability. And this government also wishes to influence improvements uh, in the national minimum wage. Um, earlier this week, the Deputy First Minister highlighted that a number of major charities, such as Engender, Poverty Alliance, Children's First and the Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations, support our proposals for the Scottish Parliament uh, to have control over this very important policy area. The STUC is another important advocate for a devolution of workplace regulation and I am confident the Smith Commission will carefully consider uh, the evidence presented by all of these bodies. Drawing on all of these influences, I believe the Fair Work Convention should support diversity, equality and increase and sustainable economic growth uh, by providing independent advice to the Scottish Government on matters relating to industrial relations, fair work and the national minimum wage and living wage. In discussions, uh, I'll seek views on the draft remit uh, to develop, uh, promote and sustain uh, a fair employment framework for Scotland. Um, and this will include specifically, uh, firstly, finding and broadcasting evidence of effective industrial relations practice. Secondly, helping to improve that dialogue between unions, employers, public bodies and government. Uh, and thirdly, uh, providing evidence-based recommendations on minimum wage rates and policies that help as many as possible low-paid workers and contribute to increased sustainable economic growth. And I would very much welcome members' views on that outline of a draft employment framework, uh, either in the context of this debate uh, or subsequently. And I would also welcome views on the STUC view that the remit should be explicit about the Fair Work Convention's role in, for example, um, exploring the potential to extend collective bargaining, uh, promoting equality and environmental reps in Scotland's workplaces and developing a joint training uh, programme for unions and management. And those specific proposals uh, featured in the Working Together report uh, and could contribute uh, substantively to their four uh, strategic themes. Now, the first theme, uh, members will recall, uh, was building industrial relations capacity and capability to boost productivity and uh, grow jobs. Uh, the second theme was supporting fair work. The third theme was helping unions, employees and employers to work together in workplaces right across Scotland. And fourthly, uh, for an evidence-based approach, uh, learning from what works in Scottish workplaces and, of course, uh, best practice internationally. So, President Officer, I endorse workplace training and development uh, and employers and employees having a shared commitment to the future growth of their organisations and communities. So, in conclusion, let me stress that I will listen very closely to the views emerging from this debate today. Let me also make clear that I will not compromise on the outcomes that we seek to deliver for the people of Scotland. Fair work helps individuals, families and communities. It helps companies to become more competitive. It boosts productivity and creates jobs. And well-rewarded and sustained employment is the best route out of poverty and the best way to tackle inequality. Presiding officer, I will end with a quote from Adam Smith's The, the Wealth of Nations, uh, which features in the Working Together report. And it's this, no society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Cameron Buchanan to speak to and move amendment 11507 Point one. Mr Buchanan, seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First of all, I wish to move the amendment in my name. This afternoon's discussion about workplace policies to boost productivity, growth and jobs is much needed. We are all agreed on the desirability of rewarding and lasting employment being available to our entire workforce. That much is clear. 
In addition, it is welcome to see cross-party recognition that innovation is playing a vital role in increasing productivity. However, it is apparent that forcing the advancement of unions, reach and power by spending more government funds is not in the best means of facilitating sustainable employment and healthy workplace relations. It is for this reason that I am opposing the member for Almond Valley's motion and have submitted my amendment. Before explaining the reasons for my disagreement with the motion, it is useful to highlight the successes that the government can facilitate when it comes to productivity, pay, jobs and growth. I am talking here about the UK government. Figures from the Office of National Statistics, released only yesterday, show that productivity in the UK work workforce is increasing. Growth in average pay is exceeding inflation, and unemployment in the July to September period was down... Certainly. Chick Brodie. Thank you for giving away. One of you, well, before we go on to the ONS, I wonder if you care to comment on the Bank of England's chief economist's comment that the fall in real, real wages since the pre-recession peak is, and I quote, unprecedented since at least the mid-1800s. Does the member accept that George Osborne has failed? Not what he is suggesting, that has failed to protect the living standards of the people of Scotland. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much indeed. I thank the member for his intervention. I don't accept that because I think it was yesterday's news and it was really not exactly what we were talking about now. The, period we, the July to September period was down 115,000 on the previous quarter. Furthermore, employment in Scotland increased by 22,000 over the three months to September to reduce the unemployment rate to 5.9%. This is all occurring as the British economy is growing at the fastest rate amongst developed countries. This is obviously all good news, and whilst there is further to go, I hope that my fellow members will join me in welcoming this. The Working Together Review Group certainly aim to answer some interesting questions, but his report has come up with the wrong answers. It recommends policies that are too interventionist and too expensive. It's all very well to say that we support well-rewarded employment and effective communication, but I think practical considerations must be addressed. The recommendation of the report to require the presence of equality and environmental representatives in all public sector workplaces would at the very least be an unnecessary intrusion, I think, on workplaces. On top of this, the report suggests that all public sector bodies should be required to establish fit-for-purpose vehicles to formally engage with unions and should be required to include a section in their annual report on their approach to industrial relations. There may be a good intention, but in my experience, the effective delivery of an organization's objectives can be severely hindered by extra layers of bureaucracy. Such time-consuming impositions can all too easily lead to the opposite effect of their intentions, Resources spent on administration rather than investment in skills and productivity uh, that can lead to increased pay. This takes me to the next point. Certainly. Jenny Mara. Kevin Way, would, would the member accept that I think uh, evidence internationally shows that those workplaces with good and constructive and regular uh, conversations and representation of their trade unions actually have the highest productivity and the best working conditions? Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. Yes, I'm coming to that in my, in my talk. This takes me to my next point, because the report casually recommends that spending of substantial sums of public money paying for education and union, for union representatives through colleges and leadership development programmes, as well as the provisions for equality representatives and environmental representatives, this would demand significant funding from the Scottish Government that perhaps goes beyond what is necessary. Unions are largely self-financed, and it is not clear that the government should redirect funds from elsewhere. In addition, it strikes me that the report focuses on the public sector at the expense of the private sector. Indeed, as the Scottish Chambers of Commerce have pointed out, a lot of Scottish government funds' focus in recent years has been on the public sector, which is where it has greater control. On this note, the limited attention that the report of the Working Together Review Group gives to the private sector employees, I think, is a cause for concern as three-quarters of jobs are in the private sector and the government could do more to help. I agree completely with the Scottish Chambers of Commerce that the biggest issue affecting productivity in the private sector is the skills shortage, and the government would do well to aim policies at improving education to address this, as well as supporting business-to-business -business cooperation. I do, however, have differing views from the members for Almond Valley on workplace policies. I would like to make it absolutely clear that I support the aim of facilitating constructive and more effective dialogue between union employees and employers. This is important for all involved, and the experience has shown that working together can lead to outcomes 
in the best interest of the employees, employers and the wider economy. CBI has pointed out that the economic downturn highlighted how flexible working practices and a more individualised model of employment relations enabled employers and employees to work together to keep people in work. This helped foster an environment of cooperative employment relations that was critical to the economic recovery. As the economy continues to grow, maintaining this positive relationship within the workplace is key. There are a number of ideas that could build on this atmosphere of cooperation, and it seems clear to me that the most effective avenue would be to foster conditions that enable constructive dialogue between employers and employees without dictating how and when. The crucial point is that individual businesses and public organisations are best placed to decide themselves to implement and decide the structure of workplace relations. This flexibility, I think, is invaluable, and I feel the need to repeat that movements to exert government interference would be a hindrance rather than a helpful development. Accordingly, Presiding Officer, I urge my fellow members to vote against this member for Armand Valley's motion as it stands, because the recommendations it endorses would direct public money towards interventions that could hinder performance and are not in the interests of employers or employees. To deliver healthy employee relations and a stronger stable economy, we must only foster the conditions for effective communication and allow organisations to decide for themselves what, is best, what best practice is. Productivity, growth and jobs would be boosted by this approach, and I therefore urge the members to support my motion to this effect. Thank you. Thank you. And to now call on Jenny Mara, around six minutes or so, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today? Important because it is centres on the matter of progressive workplace policies. And that's important because it's about improving people's working lives. And we all agree in this chamber with the dignity of work and how important that is for our community. Can I also start, presiding officer, by congratulating uh, Jim Mather, uh, the former minister, and the STUC on producing this uh, document and the, the hours of work and consultation that went into it. Presiding officer, progressive workplace policies are crucial for many reasons, but a central strand running through all the suggestions made in this review are shown through, I think, one key theme, and that is productivity, as uh, the government and the Conservatives have already touched on this afternoon. Productivity is, in itself, the cornerstone of a progressive workplace policy because it bookends those elements that make a workplace progressive in itself equal and sustainable. A progressive workplace policy comes from the need for more efficient and innovative production, and successful production is a result of those progressive policies. As Paul Krugman said, presiding officer, in his book, The Age of Diminishing Expectations, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. A country's ability to improve its standard of living over time depends almost entirely on its ability to raise its output per worker. And this is a fact that the Scottish Government indeed recognises. They have set their own targets for Scotland to rank in the top quartile for productivity against our key trading partners in the OECD by 2017. At the moment, however, presiding officer, Scotland is still ranked 17 out of 32 countries. Indeed, Scotland's relative position has remained broadly unchanged over the last four years. A more innovative approach is clearly required. And I think this document recognises that and is a good start towards that improvement. Because raising, raising the productivity of a business means it can compete on high skill and wages in a race to the top, creating the middle income jobs we need to tackle the cost of living crisis. Now, the UK Labour government uh, made good progress on closing the productivity gap, but there is still a great deal left to do. And Scotland and the UK are at roughly the same ranking in the OECD. Now, this key aspect of the report is something that the Labour Party endorses wholeheartedly and hopes to see carried forward by the Scottish Government. If elected to government in 2016 in Holyrood 2, we commit to implementing the recommendations in this report. Some of the recommendations in the report cover equality. Yes. 
Gavin Brown. Just for clarity, is that a commitment to implement all 30 recommendations in the report? Jenny Mara, and I can give you time back. Yes, it is. It's a commitment to, to implement the, the working together review. I want to come on to equality. This is crucial as we still witness a pay gap and despite reported improvements yesterday, it's still a challenge for women to get the skills, training and decent wage jobs that they need. And this is something we've debated many times in this chamber. I think the recommendation in this report, presiding officer for equality representatives, is a good step forwards. Likewise, a fair employment framework. And I was pleased to hear the minister say she is going to, to listen to uh, all parties on that. Recommendation 25 in this report would see more people with a trade union background sit on public boards and would increase female participation on these boards. The Cabinet Secretary knows that this is something particularly close to my heart and the Labour Party's agenda for the reason that these public boards make so many critical decisions about public spending and services but yet are largely unknown and not entirely representative across our communities. Yes. Jake Brody. Thank you for taking the intervention. You know, many companies don't have trade union rep representation. So what do you suggest that should happen to the employees vis-a-vis -vis board positions in these companies? Jenny Mara. Well, I think that was, is, have to be something that, that, that we'd think long and hard about, and I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary will consider. Presiding officer, equality in the workplace has been discussed these last few weeks in the Chamber. But from our request that public authorities direct at least one contract to supported businesses to our request for the living wage to be a requirement in all public sector contracts, both of these requests for legislative action to improve equality have been rejected by the government. So I would be very interested today to note how many of the 30 recommendations in this report that the government intends to enact. Presiding officer, the Working Together review highlighted the incredible importance of unions in driving equality in the workplace. And it said that unions are not simply representatives of a sectional interest, but can act as swords of justice in the workplace and elsewhere, generating positive individual and social outcomes. This review suggests closer working between the government and the unions, a push for better communication, improving equality through diversity and a mutually beneficial relationship. As I have said, we think productivity is the central crux of those things that make a workplace successful and afford our workers and the public the most basic of rights. Now, all of these recommendations can be done with political will or enacted immediately. The powers are vested in this building and in the hands of the Scottish Government today. We can begin immediately to push this forward. For this reason, presiding officer, Labour is pleased to support the government's motion today, but look forward to more detail during the course of the afternoon on how the SNP intend to implement the suggestions in the report so that we may see the potential of progressive workplaces come to fruition in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate speeches of around six minutes. I have a bit of time in hand at the moment to recompense members for interventions if they wish to take them. Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, back in 1977, I picked up a copy of the SNP and U, which contained the aims and policies of the SNP. On page 12 of that document, it stated under the section Manpower and Industrial Relations the following, and I quote, the SNP is strongly committed to the principle of direct employee participation in decision-making in industry, and believes that greater democratisation in the workplace is long overdue. It also promoted the establishment of an economic council representing unions, employers and government, and it established the SNP's commitment to the minimum wage by stating the SNP supports a statutory minimum earnings level. The final paragraph highlighted that a major increase in facilities for training and retraining is essential, together with a more effective planned and coordinated training service. It took 30 years in the election of an SNP government before staff covered by the public sector pay policy were paid the living wage, the first government in the UK to do so. Modern apprenticeships are at record levels and plans are in place to increase that number further. But despite these advances, we are left trying to improve the living standards of the people of Scotland with one hand tied behind her back. 
The problem is that employment legislation that covers the minimum wage, living wage, zero-hour contracts is still reserved to Westminster. The very issues that impact on the living standards of many Scots, but we are unable to introduce legislation here at Holyrood. However, the Working Together Review Group report Progressive Workplace Policies in Scotland make a number of recommendations that are in tune with those earlier SNP policies. The Scottish Government established the Mather Review in February to examine how better working environments can be created for our employees across the country. The report, published in August, contains 30 recommendations, including a key recommendation to establish a Fair Work Convention. The First Minister announced at the STUC conference in October that an independent Fair Work Convention would be established to develop, promote and sustain a fair employment framework for Scotland. The Fair Work Convention will encourage dialogue between unions, employer public sector bodies and government in order to promote good industrial relations. It will also be tasked with influencing UK policy on the minimum wage and the promotion of the living wage. The report was welcomed by the STUC, who recognised that it had the potential for extending collective bargaining and for democratising workplaces and, in and in industry. Sorry. Also commenting on the review group's report was Professor Ewart Keep of the Centre of Skills, Knowledge and Organisational Performance at Oxford University, who made a number of points in an article published on the Future of the UK and Scotland website. Firstly, when it comes to employment and industrial relations policy, the issues in Scotland are being conceived of and debated in ways that are strongly dissimilar from England. Secondly, it is not simply that the coalition government would neither be willing to commission nor act upon anything akin to the Working Together review and its findings, but that some within the Labour Party at Westminster would also probably find the review's report slightly uncomfortable and unsettling reading its underlying assumptions about what the accepted best practice model of industrial relations might look like are simply too radical and too strongly located within a Northern European social democratic and social partnership tradition to be liable to play well with the neoliberal media and employer interests that politicians have become used to deferring to. And finally, Scotland's approach, at least as laid out in the review's report, argues otherwise, suggesting that for reasons of both equity and efficiency, what happens in the workplace really matters to government and to wider society. As the review points out, many of the Scottish Government's long-term economic and social goals are unlikely to be achieved if productivity and economic performance do not improve, and the fruits of such gains are not more widely and equitably shared across the population. Better workplace industrial relations have an important role to play in delivering those objectives, and the review sets out one model for how this might be achieved. The SPICE briefing workplace policies to boost productivity, growth and jobs highlighted that based on GDP per hour worked, Scotland has higher productive rates than most other regions of the UK except London and the south east of England. The OECD compared the 32 developed countries on the relative efficiency using GDP per hour worked. Scotland was ranked at 17th out of 32 countries with the UK in 19th place. The top three places went to Norway, Luxembourg and Ireland. If we are to emulate those small northern European countries that occupy the top three slots, we must increase productivity. That can only happen if the people who are expected to deliver that increased productivity feel that they will benefit from those increased sales and profits. The Scottish Government's submission to the Commission a Smith Commission calls for powers over employment and employability to be devolved to this Parliament. With the powers over employment law and a minimum wage, we can ensure that the people of Scotland receive a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. With those devolved powers, we could finally complete the journey we started with the publication of SNP and U back in 1977. Thank you. I now call Ken McIntosh to be followed by Chick Brodie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And the argument for progressive 
uh, workplace policies for decent, non-exploitative, well-paid work it is one that stands on its own. But I want to begin by developing a couple of themes which emerged from yesterday's debate on welfare and the experience of some of Scotland's most vulnerable citizens. In particular, I want to pick up on a point that was put forward by both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats to defend their welfare reforms. Speakers from both parties pointed out that welfare spending was not falling in Scotland, but increasing. And at a time of welfare cuts, when unemployment is falling and employment is rising, this might strike most of us as counterintuitive. But the explanation uh, behind it is very interesting. Uh, pensions account for much uh, of the increase as, both, uh, as the number of older people uh, increases. But more strikingly, in-work benefits, most notably tax credits and housing benefit, are rising. And this leads directly onto the second point, which followed comments made by Murdo Fraser in a, a joint interview we gave yesterday, that work is the best route out of poverty. Now, in the face of it, I couldn't agree with him more, and I suspect there'll be hardly a soul on the, certainly the Labour and the SNP benches who disagrees with the sentiment expressed. Except, of course, that as a factual statement, it isn't entirely true. Work does not automatically take you out of poverty. And as the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and others have pointed out, for the first time ever, the majority of households who are living in poverty in Scotland have someone in that household who is holding down a job. So what's happening is that people are working, but they are either in part-time, temporary, or low-paid, such low-paid jobs that they cannot even afford to pay their rent. In fact, worse than that, people who have been in, in employment for some time but have had their wages frozen or their overtime cut are finding themselves slipping backwards. They're becoming less well-off with every day's work rather than becoming more prosperous. Uh, Mr. MacArthur first. For me. Liam MacArthur. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Slightly quicker to my feet than Mr Hepburn. Um, I, I, I don't dispute the fact that the, uh, the complexity of the issue doesn't lend itself to, to sound bites, but would Mr McIntosh accept that a rise of 40% in real terms in the amount spent in housing benefit over a period of 10 years of uninterrupted economic growth isn't necessarily a sign of success, nor indeed something that is sustainable? Ken McIntosh. Well, I agree with both his points, actually. I think this is the whole point about welfare reform, is that is this really how we want to, to live our lives in this country, where you can hold down a job and yet you still can't earn enough money to pay your rent? And that's the very point I was trying to make. And that is actually not the best use of taxpayers' money. I, I, the whole point is now that taxpayers, that's the, the rest of us, are having to not just help families, but we are actually subsidising employers to maintain employment practices that we wish to end. And that's the point I'm trying to get to. So we're actually paying for things that we don't want to see in the workplace. And that I will give away. Jamie Hepburn. I actually agree uh, exactly with what Mr McIntosh has said. It's just to take him back to where he says uh, the motion is somewhat inconsistent with what he's saying. But I would point out that the motion does recognise that well-rewarded and sustained employment is the best route out of poverty. So the motion isn't exactly inconsistent with the point he makes. I just make that point gently. I actually agree with what he is saying. Ken McIntosh. I, I'm not arguing against the motion. In fact, I think we're voting for the motion, so uh, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, I, I take Mr Hepburn's point. Uh, the point I was trying to make was building on yesterday's welfare debate and trying to just make a point that we are spending a lot of money, a lot of government money, supporting uh, practices that are actually not just bad for people, but they're, they're bad uh, for the employment practices and the sustainable employment practices that we wish to see. Any number of reasons, presenting officer, why we wish to see progressive, fair, sustainable employment policies. Now, turning to the key question, though, however, of what we can then do about it, and this is where it becomes slightly trickier, because I don't doubt, certainly, that many in the SNP have approached this issue in good faith, alongside the very good work of our former parliamentary colleague, Jim Mather, in leading the Working Together Review Group. John Swinney was, was responsible for establishing the National Performance Framework. And for those who are still unfamiliar with the NPF, it is akin to Oxfam's Humankind Index or other such indices which focus on measuring our well-being rather than on uh, uh, other less helpful determinants such as GDP. And for me, the NPF is an attempt, at least, to relate the decisions around government spending to more closely to outcomes, to the way we lead our lives, uh, to policies such as tackling poverty, reducing inequality, or, for example, uh, in, in supporting 
uh, improving employment practices. And there are other uh, initiatives to the, the STUC's Decent Work Campaign in particular, but I would also mention the Ethical Finance Roundtable, driven by the Islamic Finance Council and Todd's Murray, and to which the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Finance Cabinet Secretary, has also offered at least exploratory support. I see many of these initiatives sitting alongside our debate today, uh, and certainly part of what I see is our mission to build the moral economy. But how, we, how do we translate those good intentions into actions? Because that's where I'm afraid I find the Scottish Government's record at its weakest. The NPF, the National Performance Framework, uh, for example, has yet to become a budget tool in terms of application. In other words, it's very difficult to see any specific budget decision which has been taken as a result of the NPF as opposed to a uh, traditional policy process. And for example, we have had any number of opportunities through the procurement bill not just to take stronger action on the living wage, but, for example, on wage differentials. Presenting officer, I think there's a disjunction between a government party which, which often talks about how strongly it supports or it opposes, sorry, it opposes PFI or PPP projects, yet invests billions of pounds, huge sums of public money, through the Scottish Futures Trust in exactly these sorts of schemes, and in some cases clearly employing firms, as Neil Findlay pointed out yesterday, which are suspected of being blacklisters. Do ministers not recognise the contradiction between all of us agreeing here today in tax transparency, for example, in all of us, not just individuals but companies, uh, paying their taxes, and then giving tens of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money to companies like Amazon who don't or won't pay their taxes, and worse, who fail to recognise trade unions and who use zero-hours contracts? And even on supply-side measures, none of us want Scots to go into dead-end or low-skilled jobs. Yet the most striking feature of recent SNP budgets has been the way they have targeted Scotland's colleges. These are the very institutions which would do most to build the skills we need, the very institutions which would do most to invest in the people, to give them the confidence to succeed, and yet they are the very institutions who have suffered the largest cuts. Presenting officer, I won't end on that note, because I, I have no doubt that there is a strong majority uh, for progressive employment policies here in the Scottish Parliament, and in particular across the Labour and SNP uh, benches. Today's debate is yet another step in the right direction. The Fair Work Commission, alongside the Working Together Review, are positive moves which will lead to recommendations and which I hope will then lead to action, and any such moves will have Labour support. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Chick Brodie to be followed by Liam MacArthur. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I uh, welcome the debate today. The key word for me in this uh, debate is productivity. I also welcome most of the working together review paper produced by, a, a produced by the review group under the esteemed leadership of Jim Mather and, of course, the STUC. Presiding officer, I hope the chamber will forgive me if uh, I seek to draw on my personal experience of running companies across eight countries in Europe and my attendant education in their workplace uh, matters. That, uh, and then as a company troubleshooter, doctor, uh, call it what you will, on returning to Scotland to assist where I could some companies that were facing financial or managerial difficulties. It became clear from both these experiences that to achieve growth, to sustain and grow employment, to optimise profitable growth, to secure, secure greater returns for employees and owners and employers and st all stakeholders alike, that the uh, potential for conflict between capital in the form of owners and shareholders, and in some cases management, uh, and, and conflict with labour in the form of trade unions and or non-unionised employees, still ongoing, regrettably, in some quarters of the UK, had to be eradicated or at least minimised. <clears throat> Based on that experience, presiding officer, primarily with work councils in Germany, that to bring capital and labour together, working together, working more closely, required a greater participation of employees, not just in the formulation of working practices, but an encouragement for some decision-making and, indeed, maybe minor equity uh, participation in the company of which they uh, were a part. In Scotland, in Fife, in one company with which I was happily involved and associated in turning round, we secured a situation where uh, having got rid of the board, employees with more than one year's uh, employment with the company were allotted uh, these uh, board shares, uh, a minority shareholding, but still uh, shares and involvement 
in the equity of the company. There was no pension fund, but the capital growth in the shares in the company's profitable revenues have grown three times, uh, most of that since I left. But they were, uh, over the, the, the last 80 years, under strong and key uh, management, who were indeed former management, uh, uh, management in, in the company. That uh, uh, capital growth uh, for the employee should secure, will secure, a pot of income when they retire and sell their shares back uh, to the company. You might well say, well, that's the private sector. What about the public sector? Well, there was once a proposal that uh, if the public sector organisations had a committed, cost, a committed cost base, that in the, in the event of the organisation coming in below that committed cost, then there should be a reversion of part of that financial benefit to the employees, who, as I say, should be in the public sector as well, participating in the decision making. There is no greater evidence, presiding officer, the kind of participation in the rapidly, than in the rapidly burgeoning social enterprise sector, which is now producing 5% of Scotland's GDP, where there are many employee stakeholders. And that is an indication of full participation in developing the productivity uh, and, and there, thereby the, the uh, contribution to employees through the productive benefits of the companies. That contribution and others can only come about by the further enlightenment, enlightenment of shareholders, management and employees, be they unionised or non-unionised in the workplace. An enlightenment that is highlighted in the review group paper on developing capability in industrial relations. Communication and understanding of what it ostensibly it should be a capital and labour joint operation in promoting success is absolutely key. And just as the review paper requests uh, uh, that the STUC, uh, Skills Development Scotland, and the Funding Council uh, should lead the charge where employ employees, again union led or not, and indeed middle management, are securing the learning to fulfil and meet the ever-changing uh, demands and economies of the workplace and the community, and indeed the democracy within it. Of course. Gavin Brown. Grateful to the member for giving way. He said at the start of his speech that he agreed with most of the Working Together review. With which parts of the review does he not agree? Right. I, I didn't say disagree with it. I, I regret that you know, there, there are many situations where uh, there are companies, as I mentioned my question to Ms Mara, where the, there is no union, trade union base. And we have to encapsulate within the democracy within uh, these organisations and encourage employee elections of representatives to the, uh, dare I call it, the works councils. So the employee's voice must be heard. And that too is in the interest, I believe, of the owners and the shareholders, because that voice, that shared commitment, does boost productivity, as indicated by what uh, I've said. They all, become, they all become stakeholders, partners in the enterprise, be it in private or addressing the public sector, as I, as I have in terms of a, not a revenue base, but a committed cost base. Participation in decision and in equity share and communications are pointers to, I believe, a fairer, more equal and constructive work environment. And, presiding officer, the establishment of, the, of a fair work convention to promote that equality, that partnership, that cooperation will be the foundation and the basis of how we will face the social and economic challenges, not just the challenges, but also the opportunities that the global economy and our place and success in it, it will throw up. So it's not just about securing fair pay, although that obviously is key, but, but the embracing of the financial and relationship dividends that will flow from that convention, certainly, but also, I believe, from the provisions that I've suggested earlier in my speech. I, of course, presiding officer, the, the, the success of any business demands recurring innovation, a product review, renewal and diversification, capital investment and efficiency, strong marketing and selling. But it has to, be, has to be underpinned at the end of the day by the ethos that to have a high wage, high productivity economy, which we, I believe we all want, married to a sustainable growth and employment demand necessitates fair, just 
and equal industrial relations born out of good, good process and good communication. So finally, the onus is on, on, onus on all employers, on management, employees, in the public and private sector alike, have to make that communication and process a, an urgent priority. The Working Together Review Group have taken a good step forward. We have to move now very fast. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've given two members substantially over the time for interventions. Can I just point out that I have a little bit of time for interventions? Liam MacArthur to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you very much, uh, W. President Officer. Uh, can I too welcome the debate and, and also add my thanks to Jim Mather, the STUC, uh, for the production of the report. It was good to see uh, Jim back in the Scottish Parliament uh, last week, uh, no doubt sharing with those of us attending the Business in the Parliament uh, event uh, the latest gems from uh, his most up-to-date reading list. Uh, but nevertheless, Jim Mather, in his forward to the report, speaks of the pressing need to reverse inequalities, um, to expand the pervasiveness of constructive industrial relations to create gains for all. Uh, he goes on doing so, he argues, will help us to face all future challenges with the confidence that our most important resources, our people, are being given every opportunity to realise their and our fullest potential. This is a point Jenny Mara, I think, underlined in her remarks. I couldn't agree more. It's why the Liberal Democrats have put uh, the pursuit of a stronger economy, a fairer society, and creating opportunity for all at the centre of our policy perspectives. And I think it's now generally agreed that most consistently successful businesses and, and organisations here and across the world are characterised by progressive workplace uh, practices, the way in which their employees are, are treated, are valued, are encouraged and indeed supported uh, to take on responsibility. The Cabinet Secretary uh, used the example of, of SSE and I was delighted to hear of uh, their experience and, and congratulate my, my good friend and former colleague uh, Rachel McEwen, uh, who I think was also right to point out that um, uh, it's horses for courses, that, that different approaches will work for different companies and different uh, organisations. Uh, but I think there is also much to be gained from sharing from the uh, good practice that is quite clearly uh, out there. But as Cameron Buchanan's uh, amendment uh, encourages us to do, we, we should see the debate, maybe in light of yesterday's continued good economic news, um, unemployment down, uh, employment up. 2.6 million Scots are now uh, in work. After all, the, the report itself uh, was about progressive workforce policies to boost productivity, growth uh, and jobs. I, and I think it would be unfortunate where uh, SNP members to, to claim credit for the upturn, having blamed everyone else for the downturn and condemned uh, any or most of the measures taken to try and get our economy back on its feet after the crash in 2008. I think Ken McIntosh, in a characteristically reasonable appra um, appraisal of welfare reform, uh, I think the point I was making in relation to housing benefit, for example, was that what we've seen is a vast increase, 40 per cent in real terms, in housing benefit during a period of the Labour administration where we had uninterrupted economic growth. And therefore, it was something that, that was long overdue for, for challenge, not, uh, I think, to uh, deny some of the concerns that he has about in-work uh, poverty, which I think are clearly still still evident now. So it's right that we consider how we wish to see the economic growth that is emerging shaped going forward, and I think in that respect the report is exceptionally helpful. Uh, the Lib Dems and Coalition have, I think, done much to make workplace, uh, the workplace fairer, the economy stronger, and our future more certain as a result. We've listened to the, the low pay commission recommendations, and we've seen a real terms increase. We've seen the income tax threshold raised to £10,000, giving a tax cut to over 2 million low and middle earners and lifting 220,000 out of playing tax altogether. I, I also welcome the Working Together's report's focus on equality. The Royal Society of Edinburgh concluded that the doubling of women's high-level skill contribution uh, to our economy would be worth as much as £170 million per annum uh, to Scotland's national uh, income. The number of wo women in work has risen to, I think, a historic high in recent times. There are 427,000 more women in employment and almost 100,000 more women in self-employment uh, since uh, May 2010. 
but clearly there is a great deal more we can do given the base we were coming from. We have seen progress in terms of shared parental leave, uh, a key demand of the Tapping uh, All Our Talents report that again was uh, front of mind at the Science in the Parliament event uh, yesterday. We have seen a new tax-free uh, childcare scheme which could benefit almost 160,000 Scottish families uh, from next year. So these, I think, have helped. They continue to help to build a more stable labour market and a larger labour force. Uh, but to build a resilient labour force, uh, we need to focus uh, unremittingly on the issue of skills. And again, the, re the re review group, I think, makes some help helpful observations in that respect. They, uh, they talk about needing to ensure that unions are fully involved at a strategic and an operational level in the implementation of the Excellent Wood uh, Group, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary uh, would be wholehearted in her support uh, of that. It is regrettable, however, that we've seen um, cuts to the college sector, which have borne down most heavily on uh, women workers, on older workers, uh, a reduction in part-time courses that I think is inhibiting uh, the efforts of many of those seeking to upskill uh, and remain or get into the uh, labour market. I think in terms of uh, gender equality as well, I think the college sector in terms of the uh, appointment of regional college boards has not necessarily uh, punched anything like its weight. But, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think there is a shared purpose here. We may disagree um, on certain aspects of the, uh, the report or the conclusions we draw from it. There even appears to be um, some disagreement within uh, the government ranks, uh, and that is much to be applauded. Maybe this is the new dawn that we're all being promised uh, with the election of a new leader. But never but The report says we can learn from many high-performing countries, private and public organisations. We should continue uh, to do that to ensure we pick up on evolving best practice and innovation. And we need to work with the unions, uh, representative organisations and across all sectors to find innovative solutions which can help us address the challenges we face. The report is a sound foundation for that continued effort. Again, I thank Jim Mather uh, and the STUC for their contribution to the debate and to helping as we seek to achieve uh, our collective objective of creating a stronger economy and a fairer society. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Alex Riley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I'm pleased to be speaking in this afternoon's debate looking at the Working Together Review Progressive Workforce Policies in Scotland. And I, I read, read the report the, the other day and I have looked at the, the 30 recommendations. And, uh, you know, I do agree with them, but I'm not just glibly accepting them. I think that we do the, 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 the drafters of the report a disservice. We have to engage with them constructively and develop them and take them forward, or else they just their words for the sake of themselves. They have to be implemented and be, be meaningful. So saying we accept them doesn't mean you can just roll it out and get on with it. That's not how these things work. But I would like to pay tribute to Jim Mather and other review members. And actually, I wanted to read a little quote from Jim Mather and quite a powerful forward to the report, which I think sums up the, the need for this review. He said, in recent years, I have thought deeply about the matters at the core of our remit and that has forced me to read widely and do my own research. Increasingly, that meant that I was somewhat overdue in making my own contribution to this debate. So I hope that this report helps to rectify that omission in a most constructive way because it is better and more comprehensive than any solo effort that there could have been. And can I just say, Jim Mayer is a man who made a huge contribution to public life. Here, here. But before he started this review, he still felt as an individual there's more he could have done, but he couldn't do it on his own. It had to be teamwork, and that's precisely what this, this review and this report give us, with a broad range of skills from a broad range of sectors contributing to these recommendations, and I think that's vital. So I'd like to look at some of the, the recommendations. Uh, recommendation 11 uh, talks about uh, a fair employment framework that should be developed through the stakeholder body that, of course, quite rightly should be set up. Uh, and it focuses in on and understand why women and young people have particular reference, and I support that. But uh, being the convener of the cross-party group in racial equality, you'd expect me to ask what about black and minority ethnic workers as well. And given welfare reform, you'd expect me to ask about disabled workers in the workplace. That's not to slight the very, very specific challenges that women and young people have within the workplace, but it's just to give a more rounded picture to it and some more information on how we develop targets and outcomes for women and young people that doesn't make disabled and black and minority ethnic workers feel somehow undervalued with a mainstreaming of equalities within that approach. So I'd just like to draw attention to that, but I do support the recommendation. 
Also, likewise, in terms of that mainstreaming uh, uh, recommendation 8, uh, there's the, uh, a single minister, a single point of contact in Scottish Government in relation to dealing uh, with worker-workforce relations. And, uh, again, I think that's an excellent idea. Again, just a little caveat in terms of mainstreaming. Every minister, every cabinet secretary has a frontline duty within their remit to make sure they're getting things right as best they can. But I do think an individual minister having a cross-cutting remit could be a very powerful device working in partnership across portfolios. But it has to be meaningful and there has to be direction to that. And can I just give you one example of that from my own experience? The cross party group on racial equality identified that apprenticeships uh, via Skills Development Scotland wasn't particularly reaching people from the black and minority ethnic communities when we looked at the data for that. When we identified that to Scottish Enterprise and Skills Development Scotland, they sought to address it. But it was our cross party group that sought to identify that to them. So even with the best will in the world, there are always emissions in these issues, and that's directly a a workforce issue, of course. I would like to stay on in relation to uh, apprenticeships, actually, because uh, uh, recommendation one talks about union-led learning, and the Scottish Government, I'm proud to say, has uh, signalled its intention to boost even further the current record levels of apprenticeships, and how we funnel that through businesses and through companies in the private and the public sector in conjunction with our uh, union partners and colleagues to identify workplace priorities for apprenticeships, I think is pretty vital and important. So it's about how we bring meaning to that, and I think we could link in our growth in apprenticeships to union-led, uh, workplace-led learning with unions in the driving seat. One thing I would say about that as well, and I, I intend this debate to be consensual, but I, I make a point previously about Labour's comments on apprenticeships, and I don't mean it in any party political way. It's about developing the issue further. But when figures come through to say that a lot of people who are getting apprenticeships were already in jobs, the Labour Party jumped on that and they said how terrible that was. But actually, careers, and I think the Labour Party acknowledged they were just wrong about that, and that was big of them to do that. But it's about, well, I hope you identify you're wrong, you've learned the lessons, because it's about what? It's about skills progression, whether you're unemployed or in work. An apprenticeship should be available to all sectors within the workplace, and it's not just for people that, that are unemployed. And I think the unions have got a key role to play in developing apprenticeships from within the workplace. And uh, I'm happy to, to talk offline to my Labour colleagues that look confused and explain to them why that was wrong at the time. Um, now, I'd also like to... Uh, uh, briefly, yes. Ken McIntosh. Ken McIntosh, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pio. The only intervention was just to prevent the Scottish Government claiming that every apprenticeship was a job, which the Scottish Government was trying to do. Bob Doris. Oh, you can draw, uh, I, will, I will talk offline rather than waste the precious time I've got left to develop a serious point, Ken, but I think Ken is wrong in relation to that. Okay? Now, uh, I'd like to talk about recommendation, quickly, recommendation 23 and 24, because recommend, recommendation 23 says that all public sector bodies should be required to include a, a section in their annual report on their approach to industrial relations, and quite rightly so, and the, the impact their policies have on workers and workforce matters. And section, recommendation 24 it talks about worker reps in all public sector bodies. Now, the word local authorities, the words rather local authorities, jumped out at me in relation to that. The huge reforms they are going through, the huge amount of outsourcing they quite often do to alios and, and, and third sector organisations, sometimes seen as a way of uh, cutting paying conditions, quite frankly, uh, to certain workers as well. And don't, don't make any point on that other than the fact that how do you make sure that unions are actively, even actively involved at a senior level within local authorities like when they are debating close, structural change. And I think we have mm. to find a mechanism for doing that. And finally, presiding officer, um, there was some positive analysis within the report in relation to how the public sector has dealt with structural change. And I was going to talk about Greater Glasgow and Clyde and the huge reforms. Don't worry, presiding officer, I'm not going to. But I was going to talk about uh, the huge structural reforms they've had to deal with. And it's been commended, not perfect, but commended in a really practical way in how they've engaged with uh, uh, work workforce representatives and trade unions to see through what could have been a tricky and painful reorganisation, but a successful day. one that has actually benefited patients and the workforce. Many thanks. And I now call on Alex Riley to be followed by Rob Gibson. Presiding officer, I also um, rise to speak in favour of the motion and welcome 
the, pro the report today. I also welcome the, um, the Fair Work Convention that's been announced, but I do think it is important that we do see some kind of timescales being put on to this report. Um, otherwise, the danger is that it is something that is kicked into the long grass and many meetings take place. Um, and at this time, you know, we need to see there are recommendations in here, I'm sure that, that the majority of people in this chamber would agree with, um, that could move fairly quickly in terms of being implemented. So a timetable um, would be something I think that would be important. The reality... Yeah. I'm grateful to Mr Rowley. Just as a point of information, I think I'm already on record as saying that I will be coming back to uh, Parliament at the beginning of the year uh, with uh, the, the Government's final response uh, to this very detailed report. That's, that's Mr. certainly Rowley. to be welcomed, and I hope that as part of that response we will have a clear timetable in terms of um, how these recommendations can be taken forward and, and put into place. Um, because if you look at, if you look at um, the current situation, I want to draw attention to, to just a couple of issues. There is an increase um, in the use of agency workers taking place right across Scotland. Indeed, I think Unite the Union and UCAT um, have a lobby this Parliament to try and highlight um, that increase that is taking place um, across, across the country, particularly in the building sector. But I had a constituent approach me just, just a few days ago um, and, and, and tell me his current situation where he has a former miner and has been working um, for a number of different agencies. And the, 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 the tragedy is that, that these agencies tend to employ people, they take a cut, but they then tend to pay people off after, after a period of time. And last year, this constituent had actually worked for Amazon and had worked up until Christmas on this contract and then had been extended for another month. Um, he was recently paid off, went along to the agencies, only to be told that he was on a list, an Amazon list, not to be employed um, this year. And, you know, that's not the way to treat any workers. Um, and, and, and certainly something needs to be done about that. The government have put millions of pounds into Amazon um, and therefore the government should be able to have an influence on the kind of employment practices when they're putting millions of pounds into these types of companies. Yep. I, I thank the member very much for taking the intervention. Would the member agree with me, and I agree with what he said about Amazon, would he agree with me then that when the submission to the Smith Commission in regard to employment law, that should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, maybe be able to stop the practice that you've said, and I agree with you completely. Alex Riley. Well, I can't comment on the, the input that our party is having in terms of the Smith Commission. Those discussions need to take place. What I can say is that I hope that all the parties are going into those discussions with an open mind. And if that's one of the key issues that's coming up there, certainly our party should have an open mind in looking at that. I could also talk about the, the living wage. Um, the living wage, in terms of policy, employers, the, the, the um, Poverty Alliance, have reported employers who say that they have reported where the living wage, wage has been paid a 25% fall in absenteeism. 80% um, um, believe um, payment of, of the, the living wage has enhanced the quality of the work of their staff. Two-thirds say it has had a significant impact on recruitment and retention within their organisation. And 70% of living wage employers felt that paying the living wage had increased consumer awareness of their organisation's commitment to being an ethical employer. So these are all major benefits of paying the living wage that lead to better productivity, um, which is at the core of the report, as Jenny Mara said earlier. But if you take, for example, the care sector, I did table a question to the government um, some months ago to ask what discussions the government had actually had with the, the care home sector in terms of the implications of introducing the living wage. And um, the response I got was that there had not been detailed discussions. And I highlight that because I had a constituent come to my surgery in Loch Ely just a few weeks ago and talked to me about, about his, his, his wife who suffers from dementia 
and has a private company coming in and providing care. And over 10 months, there was 10 different carers had been coming in. And if you pay lower wages, then people will try and find work elsewhere. So the point about retention and being able to retain workers um, is one in the care sector that is really important. We know that 400,000 workers in Scotland would benefit from the introduction of the living wage. In the care sector, it is around 29,000 workers. And I often say, um, as somebody who in my family has experienced um, care and experienced care being given, how much is a care worker worth? And they're certainly worth more than the living wage. And if the government says they can't do that, then my colleague Hugh Henry, who's not in the chamber today, would point to Renfrew Council, who are looking at the yeah, levels of care pillars, and the, the, ba the balance and the mismatch of care introduced the living wage. And if Renfrew Council could do it, then I would assume that the Scottish Government could do it. Um, in conclusion, um, presiding officer, yes, this report is to be welcome, but we now need to make progress. And I welcome and look forward to a timetable being brought forward in January. Hey, thanks. Uh, six minute speeches now, please. I now call on Rob Gibson to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I suppose, like many other people, I'm a member of a trade union. Uh, I have been a, a, un, a trade unionist all of my working life, uh, first of all as a teacher and now in the musicians' union. And uh, in fact, they serve very different kinds of uh, uh, bodies that uh, the, their uh, um, members work for. Uh, so trade unions have a great variety of uh, roles in our life today. Unfortunately, many more of the trade unions today are representative of workers in the public sector and far fewer in the private sector than there were in the past. But uh, their work as organised bodies that represent important trades and professions uh, mean that uh, they've got to be involved in the decision making of uh, the respective workplaces. And the recommendations, for example, that, create, that suggested in the report that we're discussing, that uh, the trade union uh, um, portfolio in the government uh, be uh, the focus for a cabinet member um, is something which I think bears responsibility. I heard my colleague Bob Doris saying that all ministers are responsible, but I would suggest that uh, having a focus for that would be a good thing, not just uh, in delivering this aspect of social justice, but also perhaps extending it into the more progressive means of uh, employment that worker ownership involve and indeed are a step beyond what's dealt with in this report. Unions have a strong part in championing working people and uh, have a lot to offer as you work on issues like gender equality, diversity representation uh, and bettering working conditions. And we've got to ask ourselves why we need to have that particularly now. Well, Oxfam pointed out that uh, the UK's five richest families now own more wealth and, than the poorest 20% of the population. So the obvious need for us to find models of work where the workers share a fair part of the uh, proceeds is something which I think we've got to move into in a big way. And uh, that's why, why I think that it's long overdue for us to look at the beneficial models in Scotland that we have and indeed are mentioned in this report. The case study of Tullis Russell and Unite and Fife is a very good example where the unions are closely involved, but also because it's a worker owner organisation that's been very successful in this age. And I think we should recognise that that step on is something which is very good. Employee-owned companies not only solve the problem of company succession by eliminating the possibility of the founder or owner leaving, but also keep business more localised. Uh, the Allness-based Aquascot in my constituency began its transition to employee ownership in 2008 with a goal to complete the transition by 2016. So it's not something that happens overnight. Uh, its founders decided that uh, they would leave, first of all, 
at 2016, and they wanted the workforce of over 100 people to run the whole proceeds of what's an important producer of food in our area, and indeed for a wider supermarket uh, market like Waitrose. Aquascot is a community of professionals uh, in the food sector de dedicated to high quality local production. At the halfway point in 2012, the employees owned 42 per cent of the company's shares, and the turnover and staff numbers have risen. We know when it comes to customer satisfaction and employee satisfaction that the John Lewis partnership at the big end is one of the best examples throughout Britain. And the point about that is that we've got to find out the reasons why that is so. And it's important to recognise also that trade unions, having moved on a bit from, I remember debates with the STUC in the 1970s where employee ownership was not something they favoured at all, are now much more open to finding newer models to take this on. And we have to look at the German model in particular, where companies as large as Volkswagen have these worker councils, where there's worker directors, where in fact they have much better labour relations and indeed they have much better pay. The integration of these things is so important for achieving the kinds of uh, productivity which we all wish to see. Scotland needs to see far more worker owners and uh, you know the Aquascot concept can be uh, played out a good deal further but the Scottish Parliament uh, working in the interests of all Scots must uh, seek means at an early stage to develop uh, a strongly progressive employment policies as have been discussed in this report but I would argue that we need to go further as I've explained I believe that the trade unions and the government working together are the best uh, forces to, to take this forward. And I also recognise that we are being attacked from the neoliberal right with the idea of individualised relationships, as was mentioned by the Tory amendment proposer, uh, between workers and managers. That is the death of progressive wages. It's the death of uh, the kind of atmosphere in the workplace that is so essential to making a progressive employment situation. So from top to bottom, we need to narrow the level close, of pay please. between the top and the bottom as it is in the Nordic countries and it's widest in the Anglo-Saxon countries in the developed world. So I think there's a big lesson from this report to be learned. Many thanks. I call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Jamie Hepburn. Up to six Mr. minutes, President, please. I welcome and support the fundamental principles and assumptions of this report, which I take to be that, firstly, increased productivity and better workforce relations are complementary, and secondly, that the economic and social challenges are more likely to be addressed successfully in an environment where unions play their full part. Now, of course, there are already good examples in the public sector and the private sector, and I hope to at least uh, talk about at least one of them in uh, a moment. And I agree with um, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary that the draft framework should broadcast effective industrial relations practice. I think we, the more we know about that, the better. But on the other hand, we all know uh, of, the, of the problems and the bad practices. We've heard quite a lot about low pay. Uh, the UK leader of my party today has been talking about zero-hour contracts, among other matters. And those are very serious problems for many people uh, in Scotland and the UK. Other workplaces, perhaps the same workplaces, have problems of bullying and stress that have to be uh, tackled. And endemic across workplaces is a lack of employee voice and involvement. So these are the challenges that have to be uh, addressed. And I think this report goes a long way to dealing with those problems. And I was delighted to hear Jenny Mara say from my own front bench that Labour was committed to implementing all of the recommendations. It, it would be good in the summing up to have an indication whether um, the Scottish Government equally will uh, implement them all. I hope also the report can be a focus for public debate uh, about the current state uh, of industrial relations in Scotland and indeed across the UK. Now, I, when I read the report, I was very keen on the recommendation that there should be a stakeholder board to provide leadership and that the board should develop a fair employment framework. I take it that is what uh, the Convention is going to do, if I've misunderstood that. 
and the Cabinet Secretary will no doubt correct me. The framework should certainly seek to provide support for diversity in the workplace, in particular in regard to women and young people. And uh, like uh, Jenny Mara in her speech, I'm uh, keen on the, uh, having the equality uh, and environmental reps uh, in public sector uh, workplaces. Now, I think um, perhaps it was Cameron Buchanan or someone else who said, well, what about the private sector? The reality is some of the recommendations in this report can more easily be implemented in the public sector for which the government has direct responsibility. So it's not to say that such reps would not also uh, be, uh, of course, be desirable in the private secretary. Uh, sector. And of course, the, there is also a recommendation that we should legislate to ensure effective worker representative from representative trade unions on the board of every, every public sector body. Now, I support that, but I would also point out that, of course, that is already the case uh, in the NHS and has been from the time uh, of the last uh, administration. And obviously, I'm speaking here having had some involvement in this. And I'm very pleased that the extensive NHS partnership working that was developed and then legislated for in 2004, developed under the last administration and legislated for in the NHS Reform Act of 2004, is praised so highly uh, in this report. And it's not well enough known. There's a Scottish Partnership Forum at a national level and uh, the, uh, other bodies uh, dealing with specific matters and at local level. There's a, a complex partnership uh, arrangement uh, in the NHS that's been there for uh, really started to be developed right uh, at the start of the Scottish Parliament and um, section 4.29, 5.21 and 4.30 in the report refer in glowing terms to this and recommendation 12 says perhaps it should be translated into other sectors. So I think we do have a very good example of this working in practice and perhaps if Cameron Buchanan um, looked at some of that he might be a wee bit more positive about the potential of this partnership working. One example in section 430 is the partnership information uh, network and again this goes way back to the early days of the parliament. Unions employers working together to develop model employment policies and there's a whole series of them for example embracing equality, diversity and human rights, dealing with employee grievance, supporting work-life balance. There there is so much good practice there and if my final statement on this could actually be a quote uh, from Partnership in NHS Scotland by Nicholas Bacon and Peter Samuel and they say in our view Partnership in NHS Scotland has matured into probably the most ambitious and important contemporary innovation in British public sector and industrial relations so I think it is a shame that more is not known about that I have to declare that a certain personal interest and involvement in that but the current government has developed that uh, the word in that quote is uh, matured. So I think the current government can certainly claim credit for that particular uh, word. Now, uh, I think I've got a little bit of time left just to talk about... One minute. Um, 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 yes, one minute. Um, the development of union-led learning through Scottish Union Learning uh, and its development and learning funds. I think this is very uh, important uh, indeed. And I think the, the Scottish Trade Union, currently the Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council should agree uh, an approach that ensures that union-led learning fulfils its full potential in addressing Scotland's workplace and workforce development challenges. That's actually a quote uh, from the document. And I haven't really got time to say all the things I wanted to say about that. Uh, but I do note that there was a Scottish Union Learning and STUC report in 2011 that highlighted the role of trade unions in ensuring effective schools utilisation. And among other conclusions, it argued that effective skills utilisation has, um, has to allow workers a voice in the development of skills utilisation initiatives. So again, it repeats that theme that when uh, uh, um, employees and employers, when workers uh, and management are involved collaboratively in working together, it has many benefits in terms of the development of the workforce and in please. terms of this report, crucially, in terms of increased productivity. Many thanks. And I now call on Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Sandra White. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, President Officer, and, uh, and welcome to this debate. Can I say at the outset, I do believe it's important that we, uh, as a society, have industrial relations that ensure cooperation between uh, employers and employees. And I very much welcome uh, the work of the Working Together uh, Review. And I would uh, place on record my thanks to those who were involved in that work, particularly uh, their uh, chair, uh, our former uh, colleague uh, Jim Mather. I think all those who have served uh, in Parliament with uh, Jim would uh, testify to the energy which he uh, brings to any uh, task at hand and it's clear that's been uh, the case with the Working Together review and it's great to see him continuing to contribute 
uh, to public life in Scotland. And I would particularly uh, welcome the, uh, the very term working together uh, encapsulated in uh, the review's uh, title. I think it's this sense of working together uh, that should typify the cooperative uh, industrial relations, I believe, uh, we should be striving for. Uh, and I, I believe the, uh, uh, the government has a, a, a good uh, record in uh, that regard. And note that they have styled uh, this as a, a debate about progressive uh, workplace uh, policies. Uh, but I uh, look forward, I particularly look forward uh, to that time where uh, we uh, view the uh, sentiments as expressed uh, in the motion of capacity building, dialogue, shared commitment and real opportunities for unions, employees and employers to work together, uh, not being viewed as progressive, presiding officer, but merely a standard uh, practice. I think Rob Gibson was very correct to identify other parts of Europe where we see uh, that model far more than is the case uh, here in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, Germany, which is Europe's biggest economy, uh, uh, meets that cooperative model far uh, better than anyone who uh, suggests that uh, uh, the approach which sees better trade union recognition stymies economic activity should only look to uh, that uh, example to see why they are wrong. So this should not be uh, viewed as progressive uh, per se, uh, President Officer, but not the normal practice of other countries that we should be uh, aiming uh, for. And uh, I mentioned uh, the, the Scottish Government uh, uh, in terms of its own track record. And I think its own employment uh, is a, a pretty good one in relation to uh, good relations with its workforce. We, of course, have the uh, policy of uh, no compulsory redundancy. We've got the uh, policy of uh, the Scottish Government paying uh, the living wage for all its employees, a policy that uh, covers 180,000 people in Scotland working for the Scottish Government, its agencies and the NHS. And we know that the new rate will apply uh, from next year. That's been set out in uh, the budget. We also know that the Scottish Government has good uh, industrial relations with uh, the unions. We saw that when the FBU in England and Wales uh, went on strike due to uh, the attitude of the administrations in these jurisdictions during uh, uh, discussions and dialogue uh, uh, about the union's concerns about changes to pensions. The FBU in Scotland did not go on strike due to the uh, good uh, dialogue that was taking place with the Scottish Government. We also seen when uh, Francis Maud, Minister uh, for the Cabinet Office and Paymaster General, instructed UK uh, uh, government departments to review the provision of trade union check-off facilities, which are, of course, arrangements to uh, collect trade union subscriptions directly from salaries. Uh, John Swinney explicitly uh, ruled out uh, that approach. That was uh, uh, welcomed by Lynn Henderson, the PCS General, uh, uh, the PCS Scottish Secretary, I should say, uh, who said of John Swinney, by not following this lead, he had demonstrated to tens of thousands of PCS members and hundreds of thousands of trade union members throughout Scotland that the Scottish Government refuses to impose vindictive Tory ideology, ideology on organised workers and trade uh, unions. And of course, uh, unlike Westminster, the Scottish Government has not uh, reduced uh, trade union facility time. So I think the Scottish Government is uh, uh, acting in a manner which I uh, would like to see uh, all uh, uh, employers in Scotland doing as uh, a bare uh, uh, minimum. And of course, we have seen the Scottish Government work to promote uh, the living aid wage uh, elsewhere with uh, uh, work, uh, funding the Poverty Alliance to deliver uh, a living wage accreditation uh, scheme to promote the living wage and increase the number of private companies uh, uh, that pay it uh, across uh, Scotland. But I would like to see us being able to go uh, further. Of course, the expert group on welfare reform uh, suggested that the minimum wage should be uh, raised to the level of the living wage uh, in Scotland. And the Scottish Government is sympathetic to that uh, outlook. We are now in the uh, area of looking at uh, the process of further uh, devolution. I hope we can uh, see uh, powers vested uh, here in this part to look uh, positively at the recommendation of the expert group on welfare reform. The Welfare Reform Committee and the Finance Committee have uh, taken evidence on this matter. The Finance Committee yesterday saw uh, Professor Jim Gallagher, who advised Labour's Devolution Commission, say he was against minimum wage powers being devolved. But uh, equally, Professor David Bell told the Welfare Reform Committee that uh, powers uh, could be devolved to the Scottish uh, Parliament. So, uh, and given, I, I think, Westminster has uh, been poor to act to ensure that uh, the minimum wage keeps pace with the cost of living, I believe we should be able to legislate in this uh, area. Uh, concluding, uh, President Officer, I, I want to welcome uh, a number of recommendations, the key recommendations of the Working Together uh, Review, where they have recommended that a new body uh, should be established to provide leadership on industrial relations, including the sharing 
of best practice, uh, union involvement implementing the recommendations for, from the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce legislation to ensure uh, worker representation on the board of every public sector body uh, and that public sector bodies should include a section in their annual report on their approach to industrial relations. I welcome these and many other uh, recommendations within uh, the uh, Working Together uh, Review uh, report. Uh, I look forward to the establishment of uh, that Fair Work Convention. I hope we can look George at these recommendations. Please. And moreover, I look forward to us moving towards becoming a Fair Work Society. Many thanks. <clears throat> and I now call on Sandra White to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And I also want to thank those who took part uh, and produced this review. And in particular, as has been mentioned previously, Jim Mader, someone we all know very well. I believe they have produced a, a very important piece of work uh, which really will enhance and improve the working environment for all involved. And in particular, the areas such as they have, they have highlighted in the report about opportunities for innovation in the workplace, existing good practice, and opportunities to promote collective bargaining, which I think is very important workplace democracy, diversity and equality, another important aspect, including the participation of women, and a number of members have obviously already mentioned that particular aspect of it. Uh, as a former shop steward myself, uh, I do welcome the Fair Work Convention. I think it's a very exciting proposal, and I, I fully agree with the SGC and others uh, that the Scottish Government and the SGC should review the Memorandum of Understanding and seek ways to improve engagement between unions, governments and agencies. Uh, and when I say this, I, I don't just mean the public sector, uh, I also include in that the private sector, which I think it's really important that in certain aspects, and I think Alec Rowley touched on that when he touched on uh, care homes, etc. Uh, a number of the care homes are privately run and they're not uh, duty bound of legislation as are publicly run care homes. I think it's important we include the private sector and the third sector also. That's sometimes forgotten about, but the third sector employs an awful lot of people also. So I would like to see you know, the memorandum of understanding with the government and the trade unions uh, involve not just the public sector, but the private and the third sector also. But I do want to concentrate my, my remarks on the involvement of young people. I know a number of members have just touched on that. Malcolm Chisholm and Jamie Hepburn also touched on that part of it. Uh, I think it's very important, uh, the involvement of young people, and in particular in the working environment, and uh, also unions into schools and colleges, and uh, the youth committee of the SUC, who are working very hard, and I think possibly members here in the chamber have had contact with the youth committee, certainly in my area in Glasgow, Kelvin, uh, I've arranged to meet with them. They're working very hard to produce and push forward the, the youth's uh, uh, agenda in that particular aspect of it. And I think the reason I've picked on that particular part about uh, youth involvement is if we think back just a couple of weeks ago, uh, how the referendum uh, really engaged young people in, in schools, colleges, universities, and basically everywhere that we went about. And I really believe we should expand on, on the interest uh, that they showed in the referendum, uh, particularly in politics. And, um, by saying this, I'm not meaning party politics. I'm just meaning the fact that they were so open to talk about what was going to happen within the referendum in the parliament and how that would affect their lives. And I think it's something we should be capturing uh, while there's still this massive interest in, in this particular thing. And I would like to see, as suggested in the reviews, and if I could just quote from some of the recommendations in the reviews, the recommendation one is the Scottish Government should continue to support the development of union-led learning through the Scottish Union Learning, uh, development and learning funds, and obviously publicise the benefit of benefit of both of these, the Scottish Trade Union Congress, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. I think it's very important that we don't forget that these are work, working at the moment and they should be enhanced also. And one of the recommendations, recommendation two, uh, training for union representatives, shop stewards, learning reps, health and safety reps, uh, they should be provided through uh, further education colleges and should be funded through a fee remission arrangement and recommendation five, the SUC TUC Education in Scotland should work collaboratively with appropriate providers to develop a union leadership development programme. 
to enhance the capacity of current and future union leaders. I think that's really important because a number of us, myself included, when I became a shop steward, it was simply because I was interested in what was happening on the shop floor. And whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, I was elected by my peers to be the shop steward. I didn't really get any training for it. So I think it's a great idea to bring forward some form of training and I fully support that as well. As I said, I think these recommendations should be taken on board. And, and I would also like to suggest that to the issue of trade unions and young people's knowledge and involvement with trade unions would be greatly enhanced if this, uh, the review's recommendation where appropriate, it could perhaps be included in the curriculum for excellence. Uh, I mean, I know it's not the minister here's uh, responsibility, but perhaps you could raise this with the cabinet secretary of education. It's something I think that uh, would be very interesting to young people within our schools. And as we're talking about the you know, curriculum of excellence, putting forward, yes, I'll take an intervention. Jenny Marrett. Thank the member for giving way. I'm, I'm sure the member is aware that the STUC is currently undertaking a programme of visiting schools and letting uh, senior pupils engage with the kind of values and work of the trade unions. Would she agree with me that this is an important programme across Scotland? Sandra White. So, thank you. I certainly do agree with the, the member of Jenny Mara because I think it's a, a better way to work in Scotland as a, the programme which the, the STUC Teaching Resource is called and it's going through secondary schools, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, sometimes we concentrate too much on the fact that uh, young kids in schools have got to get the qualifications, have got to get out to work, but if they can understand how trade unions work and how it can enhance their workplace and how their working life, I think it can only be something a bit for the good. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with Jenny Mara said. And in that final moments, I'll close, and I, as, as I say once again, I think it's a great report, and I look forward to the recommendations being taken on board. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. <clears throat> I now call on Mark Griffin to be followed by Jim Meadie, six minutes or thereby. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate this afternoon on progressive workplace policies and how they're used to boost productivity, growth and jobs. I also um, welcome the publication of the, re the report from the Work Together re group, re Review Group and yeah, the chance that we get today to scrutinise those recommendations, um, expand them and um, express our support. Employment for, for me is a key part of who we are, of our own personal identity. Whenever we tend to meet someone new, one of the first few questions that we ask will quite often be, what do you do or, or where do you work? And with that in mind, it's important that we take pride in our work, that we take pride in who we work for, and for a large part of that, it's how, we're, how valued we feel by our employers. And that's why the issues addressed in the report are so crucial. Those progressive policies implemented properly give people that sense of being valued and create a, a sense of pride in your work that, that can't be bought. That sense of being valued then leads to that happier workforce, a healthier workforce, a workforce which has less sickness absence and a more productive workforce boosting growth for the company and the country. And that means the government should rightly be taking the lead on tackling issues like low pay, equal pay, zero hours contracts, blacklisting and the living wage in public procurement. I mentioned blacklisting because it still is an issue while we have companies who have operated blacklists being awarded multi-million pound contracts from local government, the NHS and hubcos. The companies who have been involved in this practice have pushed people into poverty and despair. They have wiped out a whole lifetime of working experience, and all because they stood up for their fellow workers. And those companies have yet to issue an apology for how they have operated and have yet to agree on any level of compensation. We should be looking at why they continue to win public contracts when those issues are, are unresolved. I look forward to the government's guidance which I hope will give public bodies more power and confidence in taking a stand against blacklisting when they are procuring goods and services. A key part of developing the right policies in a particular workplace will come from a, a positive relationship between trade unions and employers. And I think it's important that we talk to young people entering employment or just about to enter employment about the importance of being a trade union member. That's a point that's been covered by more than one speaker. But 
in the, re in the report and recommendation 13, in particular, it says the Scottish Government, local authorities and the STUC should engage appropriately to expand the reach of the determined to succeed, better way to work, unions into schools and colleges initiative and should ensure that unions are fully involved at strategic and operational level in the implementation of the recommendations of the Commission of Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. I was able to take part in one of those um, union into schools sessions in my old school in Cumbernauld to give my perspective on why I felt it was important to be a, a trade union member. I'd gladly take part again. Now, most of the pupils we spoke to initially didn't really have a, have a sense of, of why they would join a union. They generally knew their parents were um, members but didn't really um, know what they got from it. And sometimes read into some of the right-wing press that um, trade unions just really went on strike when they felt like it and caused a, a general unnecessary disruption. But they also didn't know about the rights that they had or would have at work, even the pupils who worked part-time. They, they didn't know there was a minimum wage for 16 to 17-year-olds, um, that young workers were entitled to a 30-minute break if they worked for more than four and a half hours, that young people have the time off, uh, the right to time off to go to college or do training, and they have the right to time off to do exams. Now, they were quite surprised by, by those things that were in place to protect and support them. Those policies which were in place because of trade union campaigns. But when I asked them what they would do um, if they were in work and their boss asked them to work late um, when they had school the next day or what they would do if their boss asked them to come in the day before they had an exam or what they would do if their boss was asking them to work a six, seven, eight hour shift continuously, what, what would they do? Um, and most of them said that they felt that they probably would have had no option other than to do what their boss told them. And that's when the importance of joining a trade union became clear, when pupils realised that they needed the strength of their fellow workers to make sure that they were confident enough to demand what they were entitled to. I think um, that highlights that we, when we come to progressive workplace policies, we all want to see that unless workers are aware of their own strength through their membership of a trade union, then, then all the, the policies in the world and for progressive uh, workforces can sometimes be, be meaningless. And I hope in particular that the government takes forward the recommendation from the working group um, with regards to union learning in schools to continue those generations of pupils who leave school and become active in their trade unions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> and we now move to the final speech in the open debate from Jim Eady, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Uh, six minutes earlier by Mr Eady. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Working Together Review, which we have been debating this afternoon, is an important contribution to the wider debate about the kind of society we want to build in Scotland. It compels us to consider what kind of Scotland we wish to see, and in so doing to ask what kind of Scotland is possible both economically and socially. That question is in part answered by the recommendations contained in this review, which signpost us to what better workplace conditions should look like through the promotion of such practices as collective bargaining, workplace democracy, respect for diversity and equality, and the participation of women on equal terms with men within the workforce, a point made by my colleague Sandra White. On that last point, I was pleased that five out of the eight members of the review group chaired by Jim Mather, were women. That sends out its own positive message. And one of the key themes of the review was developing capacity and capability in industrial relations. And here, the use of the term industrial relations rather than employment relations is about more than semantics. It's about defining an employee-employer relationship that is soundly based on genuine dialogue and partnership working for the benefit of both employees and employers. The background, of course, is that the UK's record on industrial relations is not a good one. The UK has the lowest level of industrial democracy among 28 European Union countries. Only Lithuania is worse. And that is measured by the European Participation Index, which looks at board level representation, collective um, bargaining participation, as well as trade union membership. And one illustration of this lack 
of good industrial relations is the absence of a strong employee voice in the boardrooms of our companies, something which stands in stark contrast to the experience in other countries, most notably Denmark and Germany. Rob Gibson, of course, spoke of Volkswagen as a model of good practice. And denying workers democratic power in the workplace has gone hand in hand with a deterioration in the quality of working life experienced by people in the United Kingdom. The UK has the second lowest pay among advanced economies, the third longest working hours in Europe, and a lack of job security uh, amongst workers compared with workers in many other countries. And therefore, strengthening the democratic voice of employees and embedding that within the structures of companies can bring positive benefits. The improved productivity and innovation which the Cabinet Secretary spoke of earlier. Now, Gordon MacDonald spoke about democratic participation in the workplace, and one of the ways in which we can develop capacity and capability in industrial relations is by developing board-level representation for employees. This issue was highlighted in the report published by the Jimmy Reid Foundation, Working Together, a Vision for Industrial Democracy in a Commonweal Economy, which was co-authored by John Duffy, Gregor Gall and Jim Mather. The report states board-level representation should begin at companies with 35 employees or more. All board representatives, employee and shareholder should have equal rights and access to information. They suggest that one employee representative should be delegated by the recognised trade union, one should be from a works council where that is appropriate, and the rest should be directly elected by all employees. The report goes on to advocate a cooperative rather than a coercive approach to fostering this form of industrial democracy and stated, we believe a model of this sort is beneficial for both employees and employers. However, we believe that a national consensus should be sought so implementation has the widest possible support from all sectors. We therefore propose a large, inclusive process to secure that support from both sides in industrial relations. Presiding officer, this, I believe, is the correct approach and one we should support. Ken McIntosh. Yeah, Mr. Reedy has clearly uh, welcomed the recommendations of this report. I'm just slightly uh, unclear. Does the SNP, following Chip Brody's remarks earlier, does the SNP support the, the implementation of all 30 recommendations? Is that Mr. E's understanding of the SNP's position? Well, I, I don't speak for the government. I mean, there would be no point in the commissioning a, a piece of work of this kind and then not taking seriously those recommendations. So I would expect the government to take forward as many of those recommendations as is practicable to do so. Uh, I welcome the reviewer's rec recommendations, since we're talking about those, on union-led learning, training for union representatives, and the development of equality and environmental representatives within public sector workplaces, as well as the development of a union leadership development programme, which other members have referred to, which would enhance the capacity of current and future union leaders. The review group looked at ways of supporting uh, fair employment with a number of recommendations. And I think critical here is a recognition of the legitimate role of trade unions within workplaces and wider civil society, such as the partnership working which has been developed within NHS Scotland, uh, which, um, that extensive partnership working which Malcolm Chisholm spoke of. Now, Alec Rowley spoke about the home care sector, and of course the review itself refers at point 4.33 to Unison's ethical care charter, which I think is a, is a positive uh, way forward in terms of committing authorities to buying home care services only from providers who pay uh, the living wage. Chick Brodie spoke about the need for good process and communication. Liam MacArthur said the most consistently successful economies and companies were those who adopt good progressive workplace policies. And Jamie Hepburn, in what I thought was an excellent speech, uh, expressed his aspiration that the cooperative approach to industrial relations would not be seen in time as progressive, but in fact as the norm, as indeed it is in much of Europe uh, already. Jenny Mara spoke eloquently about the role of trade unions, um, and of course the review said that much of that turns on the quality of the union management uh, relationship. Um, in conclusion, presiding officer, I would just uh, say that while that statement about the quality of the union management relationship may appear axiomatic, of course it is in contrast to a uh, Re relevant direct experience here in Scotland at Grangemouth uh, and at shipyards in Govan 
Scotsdon and Fife. That, for me, is the reason why we need close, to have a cooperative uh, form of industrial relations in this country, and that is why I fully support uh, the review group and the work that it has taken forward. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Gavin Brown, seven minutes or thereby, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, thank you. I think this has been a very uh, worthwhile debate, I have to say, and I'll start by striking a note of consensus that seemed to be mm -hmm. um, approved by all parties in the Chamber, and that's to, I think, thank uh, Jim Mather for the work that he did in this report. Uh, having shadowed Jim Mather for four years in the previous Parliament, he is always uh, somebody worth listening to, whether you agree with him or not. Um, and I think the group that were pulled together to do this report too, again, <laughs> while not agreeing with all of the conclusions of the report, uh, the calibre of the individuals involved um, are beyond uh, reproach. And again, I think they ought to be thanked uh, for the work that they did. Um, one of the most interesting points in this uh, debate, though, has been the fact that the Scottish Government, still at this stage, does not seem to have a position in relation to this review. We are in the unusual situation of the Labour Party having a rock-solid, clear policy position and a Scottish National Party that appears to be all at sea. We heard almost nothing from the Cabinet Secretary in her opening remarks about their response uh, to the 30 uh, recommendations. We had some fairly rebellious statements from SNP backbenchers today, some going as far as that they only agreed with most of the report uh, and not all of it. One even say, daring to say that he didn't speak uh, for the government in terms of taking part in a debate uh, in this chamber. I think it's quite important that the. I'm, I'm happy, happy to give way to Mr. Uh, Mr. Brody. Just, just Brody. Uh, thank you very much for taking the intervention. Just for clarity, in terms of agreeing with most of it, doesn't mean to say I agree with all of it. What, what I, I said was that it can be extended to those who don't have union representation, just as Jim Eady has referred to and it refers to companies with more than 35 employees who may not necessarily be trade union. We don't want a division in society. Evan Brown. Presenting officer, if you understand where Chick Brody stands on the issue, you're a better man uh, than I am. And it's no wonder he describes himself as a company troubleshooter doctor. Uh, an exciting title, if ever there was. But I think it's important in closing from the government, we do hear uh, where they stand on the issues. Because people were, including me, a little sceptical about the timing of this review, if I may say so. It was uh, set up in advance of the referendum, and we know that they were pressed quite firmly to make sure that the report came out in August ahead of the referendum. Mr Mather, in his forward, even states it had to be done in a short timescale. Now, forcing them into reporting in, in, in a moment, forcing them into reporting in a short timescale, but then doing almost nothing with the report in the three months since it has actually been published will make cynics like me just a little bit more sceptical about the timing of the report. But I'm happy to give way to the Cabinet Secretary. I, I wondered if uh, Mr Brown was going to address any of his remarks uh, about the failed car report that the UK Government undertook yeah. at the same time, because the Mather Commission uh, came up about this time last year, as did the car review, which made no recommendations because on the basis of the <laughs> rather pejorative uh, ideological response of the UK government that was trying to set up a car review which was all about kicking trade unions. Mr Brown. That is a typical intervention, I have to say, from the uh, Scottish Government Deputy Presiding Officer. Completely ignore their report, completely ignore any criticism of what they are responsible for and try to deflect all of the attention onto somebody else and on to something else. I think the Scottish Government, in closing, should focus on their report and what they intend to do with the responsibilities they have. Uh, Deputy Presenting Officer, uh, my colleague uh, Cameron Buchanan pointed out a number of our responses to the review, but there were, I think, some positive aspects to it as well. I think it's right that we learn from best practice, whether that is in a workplace, an organisation or a country as a whole, and I think the report makes a helpful uh, note of NHS Scotland and what they have done over the last 10 years. It's difficult to disagree with recommendation one, that you ought to continue to support Scottish union learning. Having visited Aegon uh, earlier this year, I have to say I was quite impressed uh, by what I had to see uh, and thought they were doing a pretty good job. 
The idea of having a single minister to take responsibility, I think, is perfectly sensible too, with the caveat, though, that it, I think it has to be an existing minister and it shouldn't be a fresh appointment, increasing the size of either the cabinet uh, or the ministerial team as a whole, but to have one minister um, who is currently a post that currently exists, bringing it into one portfolio, I think makes uh, perfect sense. The idea of reviewing the memorandum of understanding regularly seems fair enough too. And the idea of improving data quality so that all of us uh, have a better idea of the issues facing uh, workplaces across Scotland. I think, again, it's difficult with which uh, to disagree. But I think also my colleague Cameron Buchanan touched on the areas where we do have uh, some, some disagreement with the conclusions. Um, he suggested that in areas it could be seen to be bureaucratic, and I think uh, that may well be true. If I look at some of the ideas, the idea of having an environmental rep in every workplace who would need time off for training, who would need to have costs for training, I do question um, what the value would be of having that or enforcing that on every workplace in the public sector and beyond. I think the issue of procurement, where they suggest um, that uh, it ought to be part of the procurement process. I mean, this came up, this issue has been uh, with us for uh, months and months in terms of going through the procurement bill. Um, it's something on which the Scottish Government adopted a clear position, and I'm assuming that's one area uh, that they do not intend uh, to take forward. I think we could uh, get bureaucratic if we start having legislation uh, for board representation uh, for trade union members, and the idea of setting up um, a policy group to specifically increase the number of board members with a trade union background too, again, strikes me as a bit bureaucratic. There are costs, of course, as well in there, as my colleague uh, pointed out. It's demands on costs, whether it's setting up an environmental workplace fund, an industrial relations modernisation fund, uh, or an industrial relations learning academy. Um, who would pay for all of this? What would the cost be to each of these uh, proposals? And would all of them actually really add value? And would all of them do what we want to see, which is increasing the productivity, which I think was, again, something which everyone within the Chamber uh, thought was the most important thing to do. So there are some positive aspects, Deputy Presenting Officer, um, but there are other areas where we clearly uh, disagree with what has been put forward, hence the um, amendment uh, put forward by my colleague. Thank you. Thanks. I now call on Jenny Myra, uh, a generous eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, trade unions are a central part of Scotland's economic, social and civic landscape. With around 700,000 members in Scotland in 2013, unions are Scot Scotland's largest civic movement, and we all know the vital role that they play in our communities. And as the review we are debating today states, by engaging at a national level, unions can positively influence wide-ranging social and environmental policies to encourage greater fairness and sustainability. Issues such as education, youth employment and climate change can be addressed in this manner. And it is the role of the Scottish Government to maintain a clear dialogue with our trade unions to see the best results from such potential. And I think this dialogue illustrates the essence of equality that must run through all progressive workplace policies in order for them to be successful and sustainable. Presiding officer, such a constructive dialogue between our trade unions and the Scottish Government will also help achieve some of the areas of improvement that the Working Together Review outlines. The need to improve facilities, management of change, workplace learning and health and safety. By working together, employees, employers, unions and the Scottish Government can indeed enrich civic society and drive the change towards progressive workplaces. And with progressive workplaces, as we have illustrated here in this debate today, I think comes a more equal society. Presiding officer, as Gavin Brown just said, productivity is absolutely key to this. And I think innovation also. And I was pleased to hear the departing First Minister touch on innovation in his opening speech for the Business in Parliament conference uh, on Friday in this chamber last week. The importance of innovation, productivity in our workplaces cannot be ignored. This is good for businesses, for employees, employers, and for the job market. Presiding officer, I would like to turn to some of the contributions that have been made today because I think it's been a very interesting and informed debate. 
I'd like to start with Liam MacArthur, who highlighted how progressive workplace cult policies make for productive workplaces. And he underlined, I think, um, the best out of any speaker today, the importance of women's work to the economy. The need to focus unremittingly on the issue of skills. And this is an interest that both he and I share. And he was right, you know, presiding officer, to highlight the cuts to colleges. We know that there are 140,000 less places since this government came to power. And the kind of skills and the kind of workplaces we are talking about, colleges should be the powerhouses of that modern industrial economy. So Liam MacArthur is right to point to that very important issue. And the cuts to colleges, as I've said to the Cabinet Secretary on many occasions, have disproportionately affected women, older workers and part-time courses for people returning to the workplace. And it would be um, foolish of us to talk about progressive workplace policies if we are not talking about opportunities for the skills and training that underpin those progressive workplaces. And I think Liam MacArthur was also right in the vein of equality to point out the government's recent appointments to college regional boards when I think I'm right in saying that 10 out of the 12 appointments for those chairs of college boards were, were given to men, just two of them, uh, to women across this country, which I think is indicative of the Scottish Government's actual commitment to, to the gender uh, equality. And I hope that when we hear the response in January that we will see um, more commitment come forward. Presiding Officer Alec Rowley, I think, gave a very interesting and good speech today. He welcomed the Fair Work Convention, as I do too, and everyone on the Labour benches does. He suggested timescales on the report, and I think it was a very good point that my colleague made. Now, some of the recommendations could be implemented fairly quickly. All of 30 recommendations could be implemented now as the power is in the government's hands. Now, the government said, Angela Constance said, that there will be a response at the start of next year. And Alec Rowley, Alec Rowley rightly pointed out that he expected a timetable to be part of that response. And I hope that the Cabinet Secretary can commit to that timetable in her closing remarks this afternoon. I think Sandra White made a very interesting speech. I always enjoy listening to uh, Sandra White's contributions in this chamber because she raised her own valuable experience of being elected as a shop steward. But being elected to that role, probably because of her innate passion and commitment to what was going on in that workplace and to her fellow workers, but having no specific training for that role. And, presiding officer, I see this at my own surgery where uh, trade union reps have come and feel that they need more training actually from their unions to properly represent their members. I think training is key and I think Sandra White is right to point uh, this out. And properly trained union representatives in our workplaces make, um, I think, life better for both employees and employers and the success of our public services and businesses. Malcolm Chisholm, as always, uh, made a very eloquent contribution this afternoon and highlighted the real issues of bullying in the workplace. I think he was the only speaker to do so this afternoon, but I hope uh, and I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary will reflect on that very important issue as she develops the recommendations um, in this chamber. He also highlighted the work that the Labour Administration did when we were in government here on um, working representation on NHS boards. And it seems to me now, um, in retrospect, that um, it's perhaps a bit overdue that this uh, initiative is extended to other public sector bodies. That's recommendation number 24 in this document. And I certainly hope that if the government isn't committing to all the recommendations this afternoon, that that will certainly be one of them. And that brings me to the point, presiding officer, how many of the 30 recommendations is the Scottish Government signing up to, or will we wait till January to hear that? Um, I think if the Cabinet Secretary could address these this afternoon as well, that would be useful. Presiding Officer, finally, I think the Government's announcement of a Fair Work Convention is very welcome. However, I would sound a note of caution on this. It cannot just be a talking shop. 
Now, this government, for all the warmth that has shown today to this document, came up short when asked to vote for the living wage and public sector contracts just a couple of weeks ago and to use procurement to bolster supported businesses just two weeks ago in this chamber. The Christie Commission, although lauded by the SNP at the time, is by and large getting dusty on the shelf. No major reform to public service since it was published in 2011 and welcomed by the SNP government. The SNP government hasn't seen any um, of focus with a great intensity on the preventative agenda which the Christie Commission recommended and which would in the long term save money. So the test for this review and the test for the Fairer Work Convention, like for Christie, is how willing this government is to drive policy, make change happen and legislate where that is necessary. Cosy consensus in this chamber is all very well and the majority in this chamber stand full square behind this review and the government motion this afternoon. But the proof is always is whether we can make this change happen in our communities and in our workplaces. And the will to drive that change is largely in the hands of the Scottish Government. The Labour benches are delighted to support this review, its recommendations and the Government motion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on the Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, to wind up the debate. And the Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock. Thank you, President Officer. I want to start by once again putting on record my thanks to Jim Mather and each and every one of the members of the Working Together uh, Review uh, Commission. It was indeed a commission that had 50-50 uh, representation between employers and trade unions. The employers were evenly split between the public and private sector and as a review body it even had 50-50 uh, in terms of uh, representation uh, from men and women and I think that's certainly uh, a marker on the way to go uh, for the future. And I suppose like Liam MacArthur uh, I'm always very impressed uh, by Mr Mather's uh, reading list um, although he will appreciate as a busy uh, working mother um, I you know, enjoy listening uh, to Mr Mather but very rarely get the opportunity uh, to read the books that he has the, the, the time to, to read. President officer, this debate is uh, an important part of the Scottish Government's engagement process. It is important uh, that members across the Chamber uh, get an opportunity to identify their own options and ideas and indeed are able to shape and influence uh, the Scottish Government's response. And I will speak a bit more in detail as requested by members um, about our response in more detail. But it is important that we do work together to build consensus and this afternoon uh, has indeed uh, mostly been constructive uh, and uh, consensual. Although I have to say I was somewhat stunned at the beginning of the debate uh, by some of Mr Buchanan's comments. Uh, I was somewhat surprised that at one point he fell asleep during proceedings. Um, but a particular comment that I was particularly surprised at was that he felt that the Scottish Government uh, was forcing uh, the advancement of trade unionism. And that, to me, uh, sounded like a comment uh, from uh, a different uh, era. And if perhaps I can leave him uh, with this quote uh, from... Uh, Joseph Stiglitz that says that unions are vilified and in many states there are explicit attempts to undermine them but there is no recognition of the important role that they can play in countervailing other special interests and in defending the basic social protections that are necessary if workers are to accept change and to adjust to the changing uh, economic uh, environment. And uh, the Scottish Government, like most uh, MSPs in this chamber, is very much in favour of effective trade unionism and fair employment practice, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's actually the smart thing to do for the sake uh, of our economy. So it won't come as any surprise uh, to Mr Cameron that I won't be supporting the Tory uh, amendment this evening because the amendment fails to actually welcome the Working Together review and also, crucially, it fails to endorse uh, the establishment of a fair work convention. And the view of this government is that economic competitiveness goes hand in hand with social justice. 
and there is indeed a direct connection between well-rewarded and sustainable employment, productivity and innovation and uh, economic growth. President Officer, it was Graeme Smith that described the Working Together Review as one of the most important uh, pieces of work, uh, and I would concur with that. But it was actually it was Bob Doris who got to the, the heart of the matter, and that's about social partnership. That's about the government, employers and trade unions working together. And it's not at this stage for the government to be prescriptive about that model of social partnership but it is imperative that we work together, both as government, trade unionists and indeed employers from all sectors, employers large and small, to devise our own system of social partnership here in Scotland. And surely there is a very compelling case uh, for collective working together and working in common cause to ensure we get that quality and productive dialogue between the government employers uh, and indeed uh, trade unions. Can I say to Alex Rowley, Jenny Mara, Malcolm Chisholm uh, and indeed Mr uh, Brown to reiterate the government will give its final response uh, in January and of course we will be uh, mapping out the way forward. You can call it a timetable uh, if you wish. And I have to say to Chamber, presiding officer, that there is no recommendation in this report that I am adverse to. And in particular, I have welcomed the comments that people recognise that we have made quick progress uh, with the announcement that we are going to establish a fair work uh, convention. But we have to recognise that many of the requirements do indeed require discussion, further discussion with both employers and our trade union colleagues. But I will perhaps uh, give one recommendation that it is not uh, for me to give a view on and whether or not there is a single minister uh, in charge of industrial relations. That is entirely a matter uh, for the First Minister and the new uh, First Minister in particular. Now, Jenny Marrer and others spoke of the importance of uh, productivity uh, in Scotland. And, of course, productivity uh, in Scotland um, has increased uh, from 94% of UK levels in 2007 uh, to 101% uh, in 2012. So progress uh, is moving in the right direction. One moment, direction. Minister. One moment. There's just far too much noise from people just coming into the chamber. Uh, please extend the Minister the courtesy of listening. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. It's important to emphasise that productivity levels in Scotland uh, are moving in the right direction. We are indeed making progress, but of course uh, there is much more to do, and that's why the Working Together Review and the Fair Working Commission will help make uh, further improvements. Now, Rob Gibson and Malcolm Chisholm uh, enlivened the debate with very pragmatic case examples from their own constituency uh, and uh, their own experience. And Malcolm Chisholm um, is right uh, to highlight uh, the importance uh, and the effectiveness of the NHS governance models, uh, the, having the employee representative as directors uh, on the board. And this is something that this government is most certainly uh, looking seriously at and to see how that good practice uh, could be extended um, elsewhere. And it was Jim Eady who spoke of what kind of Scotland uh, that we want to be. And many members uh, touched upon uh, the Smith Commission and the desire uh, for more powers uh, in this parliament. It was Gordon MacDonald uh, that did that in particular. And while I'm not going to uh, speculate about the outcomes of the Smith Commission, um, all parties are participating in that process uh, productively uh, and uh, maturely. It is important to highlight the survey uh, undertaken by the Poverty Alliance that 91.5% of respondents felt that Scotland uh, should have the power to set and enforce uh, the national minimum wage. And I would call on all parties, like the Deputy First Minister did earlier this week, to commit to supporting those very positive proposals that have come from the major charities and third sector organisations uh, in Scotland uh, to get in line 
with Civic Scotland and recognise the importance of this place being able to have the power and make recommendations uh, regarding the national minimum wage. Because Ken McIntosh was right, the cost of living has rocketed, wages have stagnated and in-work poverty is very much uh, the issue of today. And it is quite simply not acceptable for folk to have to work for their poverty. And if I can encapsulate the aims of the Fair Work Commission, which is indeed to exert greater Scottish influence over the national minimum wage, to champion good industrial relations, including the payment of the living wage, as the expectation and not the exception. For the Fair Work Commission to be a powerful advocate of the partnership approach which characterises Scottish industrial relations at their best. And for the Fair Work Commission to highlight the fact that business productivity goes hand in hand with proper pay, with decent pay, with fair and equal pay. And my hope for the future is that the Fair Work Commission and indeed this Parliament will most certainly not be a talking shop and that will be organisations that will indeed have teeth and the power to implement. Because it was Mark Griffin that spoke about how work is part of our identity. It is part of who and what we are. And we must ensure that all of our people are valued, rewarded, engaged in their work and we must allow everyone to feel that they have a stake in the success of their workplace, their community and indeed their country. And the Scottish Government is working to build that sort of economy and working to build that sort of society. And after the energising process of the referendum, Scotland will never be the same. It will indeed be a better place. And we have uh, the power to act. And when we as a government have the power to act, we certainly the ministers uh, do in the last act 30 to seconds. make uh, a difference. And I hope that all members, uh, as they have intimated today, uh, will get behind the Fair Work Commission and make sure that it will make a difference to the working lives of people the length and breadth of Scotland. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on progressive workplace policies to boost productivity, growth and jobs. Uh, we now move to decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment number 11507.1 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, which seeks to amend motion number 11507 in the name of Angela Constance on progressive workplace policies be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11507.1 in the name of Cameron Buchanan is yes, 11, no, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11507 in the name of Angela Constance on progressive workplace policies be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 11507 in the name of Angela Constance is as follows. Yes, 93. No, 11. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.